Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Bellato. And before we turn the page to a, a I don't want to call it a must win because it's really not. Some people have framed it as a must win game, but a pivotal game for the Giants season against the Washington Commanders this Sunday at home. We need to wrap things up on their Thanksgiving loss to the Cowboys. And that means breaking down the defensive film. And we're going to do that today. And it's funny, Nick, because you'll see in the well for those listening or those watching you've already seen the headline and the headline for this is a positive one there what the, the interesting thing about this tape for me nick is it's not like it's the only positive i would say and we'll talk about this throughout the tonight's show but another positive was the pass coverage which looked much better than expected but there's a major positive takeaway from this game and that positive takeaway is gave on thibodeau i think on film he had his best game of his career with the giants that i'll get your take on but perhaps more interestingly Austin Gale of Pro Football Focus, who does watch a lot of film and break down a lot of film and has no affiliation to the Giants. Some people have even called them those guys like Giants haters. Uh, they think <laughs> you know, anything negative. He said it was the best film that he's seen from a single rookie edge rusher this entire season. Gabe on Thibodeau against the Cowboys. So I'm excited to break those plays down with you, and I'm excited to have him as a bright spot. He really showed when when the light shined and I think he's going to have a really big game against the Washington football team as well. Commanders, whatever they're called, because he rose to the occasion against the Cowboys. I kind of proved he can do it and he's starting to come into his own. So I wanted to start the show there and see what your thoughts were on Austin Gale's kind of proclamation. Now I haven't seen every game from rookie edge rusher, so I can't really weigh into that. But in terms of Kayvon Thibodeau's career that I've watched extensively at this point, absolutely that was his most effective and best game. And honestly, one of his best reps was called back, I believe, or was a um, it was the Darnay Holmes phantom call, I think 2.0. That was one of Kayvon Thibodeau's best reps winning high side. He just gets to his rip moves so quickly to have nine pressures in a nationally televised game. Five quarterback hits should have been 10, should have been six. It was really impressive. And honestly, I did a, a and I broke down his tape for Big Blue View. If anybody wants to go check that out on their YouTube page and on their website, I have a pretty extensive breakdown of Cave on Thibodeau. But I got to say, man, I came away really impressed. He's right, man. It's December football now. We're entering December football territory. Discuss that after Art Stapleton asked him a question in today's press conference. And you just got to put your, your foot down on the pedal and keep accelerating at this point. And I just love how he is really starting to come into his own and he seems comfortable out there because Dallas, they did some things like aligning a couple tight ends towards him, trying to take care of him when he was a sandbacker. But every time they made the mistake of leaving him one-on-one -on -one against a tight end, he took advantage of it. And that's what good young players are doing right now or should be doing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the stats showed it. You broke them down earlier. The pressures were there. The hits were there. The sacks didn't come, but that's, you know, at least according to Nick and I, those are that's not what you should be following. Those are not predictive stat sacks. They're very, you know, B.J. Hill had five and a half sacks his rookie season, never matched that total again with the Giants. And in my opinion, had better film every other year than his rookie season, to be quite frank. Like, I thought he was better on t every other year with the yeah. Giants. So it doesn't always add up. But in addition to what he did as a pass rusher, he was also really dominant as a run defender and had some flashy reps as a run defender. One you put on your Twitter was just awesome. I mean, we'll go over it soon, so we don't need to spoil it, but he's already playing like a complete player. Is he a dominant player right now? No, he's not a dominant player. He doesn't look like Micah Parsons does out there. That's obvious, and I don't think he ever will. He's, it's, You don't find Micah Parsons in every draft, but one thing I do really appreciate about his rookie season, I think has gone somewhat under the radar, is that it's been a very balanced rookie season. It's complete. It's not like we've seen a lot of these rookie pass rushers come in, these edge guys, and they have like big-time flashes as pass rushers. And you see it. And sometimes they stack those games like four, three, four, five games in a row as a pass rusher. But then they're struggling as a run defender and their liability in a lot of ways as a run defender. The opposite has really been true with Thibodeau. He's been the furthest thing from a liability as a run defender. He's been a big reason why the Giants run defenses, even though I know the numbers suck, but he's been a big reason why they haven't been even worse in run defense, I guess is a good way to describe it. He saved a lot of plays. And so I do really appreciate how balanced he's been. But this was the first time where it felt like I was watching film where this guy was just all over the place every single snap and a lot of the times look it's not always his fault when Dak Prescott throws with incredible anticipation down the field which he did multiple times Dak Prescott yeah. was absolutely cooking in the second half of this game his touchdown throw to Dalton Schultz is a throw I've never seen Daniel Jones make ever 
from an anticipation standpoint. And I don't see very few quarterbacks make that throw. Dalton Schultz wasn't even like close to his break when he released that football. And the only reason he released the football is because the Giants ran a four-man pressure with a stunt, with a twist, and they got to Dak even with four men. And he just threw the ball before he gets out of his break perfectly. So, I mean, like part of this was also Dak getting rid of the football with the anticipation. And that means, you know, you don't get as many chances at actual sacks in addition to the pressures and the hits. But I got to say, this was my favorite film from Dibido. We're probably spoiling uh, best player on film, but maybe not. We'll see if you have a different <laughs> opinion on that. But that's where I wanted to start this. And and we'll get into some other stuff. What were some other key takeaways before we touch, the fi- touch on the film? Just the third down defense ended up being horrendous in this game. But honestly, man, looking at the coverage, the coverage was relatively tight all things considered. Like you're back there with Rodarius Williams, who I felt like had a really good game and not just because of the interception. He was only beat a couple times throughout this game. Nick McLeod and these practice squad back end roster type of players against Michael Gallup, who was a really good wide receiver, CD Lamb, who is one of the top receivers in the league and Dak Prescott, who is criminally underrated. And you were able to hold your own while bringing pressure, running cover zero and, and sticking to what Wink Martindale wants to do from a philosophical standpoint. So I thought the coverage was much better than I anticipated after I got done watching the film. That's probably my primary takeaway. As a lot of people said after the game, coaches and and everything, they battled their ass off those cornerbacks. Yeah, that was another big takeaway for me. And it's not even just the interception. Rodarius Williams, my favorite rep was the one he had on the go ball towards the end of the game down the left hash. I mean, that was a very well thrown ball by Dak Prescott and you have to make an incredible play on it. Not only just get your head around, but to then get your hand in the right position to tip that ball. And so you'll see that the only player I thought struggled a bit in coverage was Darnay Holmes, but he had a tough matchup. I mean, Wink really let him go one-on-one a lot with CD lamb and that's just not a good matchup. And I regret uh, personally, and we'll talk about it. Some of these, but you know, I, some of these blitzes, I was just like, dude, just bracket, use another guy to bracket CD lamb. Like that's where he wants to go on these third and long situations. We don't need to be sending 17,000 blitzers against a quarterback like Dak who processes fast. Like let's drop some of these guys into those passing lanes. Let's try to bracket CD lamb and make things more difficult for him and make him have to go to a different receiver. Cause when he wanted to go those third down conversions, some were called for flags. We agree with disagree. That's not the point. He would always go to Lamb, it felt like, or he would try to go to Lamb, it felt like. And so that was one thing I didn't like. But outside of Holmes, I did agree with you on the coverage standpoint. One thing I wanted to bring up, too. Yeah, oh, yeah, even Holmes had, Holmes had a couple good reps, too. And one of the times they ended up bracketing C.D. Lamb, it was a three-by-one set. C.D. Lamb was a number three wide receiver. And Darnay Holmes got his head around, knocked the football up in the air, and Julian Love ended up intercepting it. To me, I think that's a bracket type yeah. of coverage. It looks like a too high coverage, but the way Julian Love bails from the hash, basically to the numbers, to me, it looked like the Giants were anticipating a seven route, a corner route from CD Lamb from that number three spot. And Julian, or and I'm sorry, Darnay Holmes did a really good job getting through the catch point and knocking the football up in the air. But you're completely right. Darnay Holmes struggled. That was not a great affair for him. And he's not a player that you should be trusting against cd lamb in that type of situation but unfortunately that's just the state of the giants roster right now in the secondary with all the injuries but i think that also gives me like a positive feeling about this next match against washington because a lot of the times and we see it on the film here like the pressure got there the giants got there like a lot of it was Thibodeau, a lot of it was this was the games they were playing with the twist but they got there and dak just through with anticipation. I don't think Taylor Heineke is going to be able to do the same thing, quite frankly, against the Giants. I just, I've seen enough Heineke and I've seen enough Dak to know that's the case. And I feel like the pressure in this game was as good as it's been since maybe, I'm trying to think of the last time I felt this good about the Giants pressure in a game. I'd have to think back uh, to 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 you know another game in our past. I, mean, I can't really remember any game that was like this, and it doesn't seem like that, right? Because Dallas like tore them up in the second half, and <laughs> the defense wasn't great in this one. They gave up a lot of third and longs, but a lot of that, in my mind at least, was just because they were got a little too aggressive with the blitz calls, and also because just it's tough to cu- it's tough to stop this pass offense. Dak th- Dak had a really good second half, as you guys are about to see. One more thing I wanted to bring up: this just shows the stark contrast right now between the Giants and the Cowboys. Cowboys got a lot from their tight ends in this game from a blocking standpoint. And that's a lot of the reason why they're able to make some of these runs, successful runs versus the giants who had basically no successful runs the entire game. They have a six yard run. That was like their best run of the day at this stage. You know, we are learning the importance of the tight ends in the NFL game. In my mind, at least they're becoming even more important as far as can they block? Can they contribute to your run game? It's part of the reason why, because I watched Jake Ferguson in this game. I thought he was fantastic in this game. And Jake Ferguson is going to. Oh, really? You thought that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, really? You yeah. thought that? <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true. It's true. You're right. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah. Oh, 100. I mean, percent We love them coming good. out too, man. His biggest knock was out. what? His biggest knock was what? Oh, he might not be that athletic, dude. Or sorry, the dude yeah. left over the top of Jason Pinnock, who like he wasn't feet. really low and stayed on his feet. That is an athletic play, man. Yeah, I think he was just hidden by really bad quarterback play with the Badgers, but he's also a much bigger. I think when it comes to the tight ends, as I'm looking forward to drafts, dude, like I'm looking at it like you can. Ne- I'm starting to think of it like the O line almost. You can never have too many tight ends in a lot of ways. Like as far as the two way guys, I don't need to like be going out here and trying to like find the next Lawrence Cager types. Like I'm kind of done with the Ingram Cagers. Like I like Cager. I'm not trying to knock him. Like he's fine for what he is. But I want as far as those two way types goes, the Bellingers, like those types of prospects. I want more. I just, I would, wouldn't mind a draft where we take two and we just like see what happened. Like, you know, like we had taken Ferguson and Bellinger. I would have been okay with that. And I think the Giants would have been in a much better place right now, personally, if they had him for when Bellinger goes down or Bellinger for when Ferguson goes down or when they're both healthy, you have them both on the field. So just something to think about as we move forward with, with a class like that, because we knew that tight end class was insanely deep. We talked a lot about that in March and April, how we thought there was a big sweet spot for tight ends in that third to fifth round range. And so far, there have been a lot of good tight ends who have cut, who've emerged for them, especially for rookie season where tight ends are usually just nothing. Think about it, too, from a scheme standpoint. When you align in 13, 12 personnel, and usually a lot of teams are doing it double Y, even triple Y sets. Dallas would do it with a big offensive lineman. The Giants do the same exact thing. You can run that play-action passing attack, and it really just gets the defense out of position. And I think watching both the film of the Giants and the Dallas Cowboys, both those teams attempted to do that. Like Daniel Jones, they had the defense, especially early in the game with those play action slide plays, pursuing Saquon Barkley and then having tight ends and backside receivers crossing the middle of the field. You're going to see the same thing from the Dallas Cowboys in this game, especially a little bit later on. But you're right, man, getting the the 13 personnel package, getting the blocking element out and having multiple tight ends block Kayvon Thibodeau. So it's not just he can defeat Dalton Schultz like he's done several times throughout this game. I think that was a big part of the second half offense for the Dallas Cowboys. And we're about to see all that. And another thing, man, I just wanted to bring up is watching Zach Martin in this game is like unfair. Watching how smooth he is on his combo blocks, on his ace and deuce yep. blocks, how he blocks and climbs up to the second level and how he's right in the lap of Jalen Smith or right in the lap of Micah McFadden. It's like, that is what a really good Pro Bowl guard is like. I just feel like we haven't had that for so long. Like Kevin Zeitler was a good guard here, but he like Zach Martin, level. dude. Yeah. Nah, man, that guy is insane. Yeah. And it's not they- even... It's not even like he's just dominating and like throwing people out of the club like we see with Quentin no. Nelson sometimes. It's just he's always where he needs to be, you know? And right. like from a technical standpoint, he's just so freaking sound. It's, it's That's frustrating. Like how Joe Thomas was. That's a, a lot of ways how Joe Thomas was at, on the tackle, on the island, at tackle. He was never overly dominant, never like a physical beast. He was just technically so sound. Those are kind of the best. Like, those are the guys you trust the most. And Zach Martin's done this for so long now. Um, one more thing I want to get to, a few more things I want to get to actually before we go this, courtesy of – Dougie Fresh, I'm calling him Doug Analytics on Twitter. You you didn't get the last reference of halftime. That was actually Nas from Illmatic, the greatest rap album of all time. Something you one day have to listen to. But uh, Dougie Fresh is like a is a I think he was like an old school rapper in like the 90s that my favorite rapper ever, Big L, would reference a lot. He would be like he would always shout it out to Dougie Fresh. I think Dougie Fresh may have even died. I don't know the history because he would say some things like oh he's up in heavens with Dougie Fresh. So I don't know. But uh, Dougie Fresh is what I'm calling Doug Analytics. And a few things that are interesting to me that stood out. One thing you mentioned earlier, the story of this game, the Cowboys converted seven of 11 third downs. It's an insane percentage, especially when you consider how many were third and long attempts. Uh, That was 63.6%. Based on the distance to go, they were only expected to convert 32.8% of those third downs. So that was a difference of 30.8% conversion over expected. That, at least to me, speaks volumes to the coaching. I got to be honest with you, Nick. And, And we'll talk about it as we get to it, but I just didn't, I don't know what, I just, I don't know. I didn't love all the calls by Wink. Cause some of the some of the blitzes that just, especially when you see him just not getting home and they're from distances and depth, and it's just like the ball's out of Dak's hand. You're like, well, maybe if someone was in the passing lane, it would have been a little different. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about here: the Cowboys produced a 1.03 EPA on all third downs. It's a ridiculously high number. This one was really interesting to me. Nine of Dak Prescott's 30 attempts were into tight coverage. That's when a defender is within one yard or less of the receiver. That was 30%, the highest rate of all the Thanksgiving quarterbacks. It's a very high rate when you look at it versus the league. Daniel Jones is at just 14.6%. That's uh, 19th highest in the NFL. 
that was, you know, Dak Prescott is not afraid to throw tight window balls and it, two were intercepted. You know, he had two intercepted passes. Not the first one wasn't into a tight window. The second one was, but that's kind of the give and take. And ultimately, man, I, I, I am for it. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm for the tight window throws. They lead to interference calls. They lead to holdings. They lead to good plays from your receivers. They lead to big explosive plays. And so I'll give up an interception here. And then if I can get some tight window throws versus just producing nothing in a passing offense. First off, According to Wikipedia, which never lies, Dougie Fresh is still alive and well, oh, so let's not Dougie. wish him ill. Good for Dougie, right? And on the point of this, the tight window throws, the the eleven play, ninety three yard drive that was capped off with the Ezekiel Elliott touchdown, the first touchdown of the game for Dallas. Those third and shorts on their side of the field, the coverage was excellent. Like Nick McLeod yeah. was draped all over Michael Gallup on the one play. And Michael Gallup just made a strong hands catch. It's like Dak Prescott trusted his guys. Now, the one time he trusted Michael Gallup at the sideline, I don't think him and Gallup are on the same page. Rodarius Williams made a really good break on the football near the sideline to come down with that. But that passing attack is dangerous when all things are clicking. And when Wink Martindale decided to bring all that pressure, leaving those guys out there on an island, it worked initially, but it didn't work down the stretch of the game. And it was exploited by Dak Prescott, who, as you've said several times on this podcast, is one of the quickest processors at the quarterback position. And I think this game is a good indication of that. Yeah, Dak doesn't really have, in my mind at least, like any kind of incredible quarterback tools, if you really think about it. Like, he's not like he throws a bad ball. I kind of feel like yeah. his arm talent is pretty comparable to Jones, to be honest. I see a lot of similarities when I watch them on film. You would say probably Dak's a little better, right? And that's probably fair. Um, he's probably... I don't know if I would say it's a little – because I think Daniel Jones has, has pretty good arm right. talent. Like, I think he can yeah. make all the throws and that's that, normal quarter, that. that normal quarterbacks make. The thing right. is, right now, there are several quarterbacks in the NFL who aren't normal. Like who aren't even close to normal, like Josh Allen right. and Patrick right. Mahomes. People are thinking like those guys are the norm. Like you're not finding those types of individuals, but Dak Prescott and Daniel Jones to me can make every NFL throw. It's just not the, the allure of those two individuals, Allen and Mahomes. And a lot of ways, I think they do have similar arm talent. Like I don't really think Dak does too much like ripping velocity through tight windows. I think a lot of, I think the ball looks pretty similar to me when it comes out from a velocity standpoint, from a distance standpoint, from, you know, the ability to throw from different arm angles and arm slots. Dak got a pretty good one where he was rolling to his left and hit a sideline ball to CeeDee Lamb outside the numbers where Lamb had like that sick one-handed catch, which in my mind was just a better throw than catch because that was a really tough throw to make outside the numbers while rolling to your left. So like he has some of those that maybe Jones doesn't have. So I would guess he would be better. But for me, the biggest difference between Dak and Jones is Dak is willing, is, is much more willing thrower to take, to take chances. And also he just processes so much faster and understands where he's going to be, but we'll see that throughout this game. And I wanted he's, to bring up he's more points. anticipatory. He's way more anticipatory, more anticipatory thrower. It's not. Yeah. Those it's, two can't. It's, really it's the hip. Maybe thrust. The hip. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But um, we'll see that throughout the game. But I did want to bring up those tight window throws because I thought that was very interesting about Dak Prescott in this game. Um, all right, let's dive into the tape here. It starts here with a five-play, 21-yard drive where the Dallas Cowboys bogged down at the very end of it and then called a very inexplicable play call, I thought, on fourth and two. Um, just not attacking what the Giants do do wrong. But they start the game off with a little jet sweep action to CeeDee Lamb, 12-yard gain here. Yeah, this at this point, I was like, oh, crap, they're attacking laterally, just like they yep. did back in week three. And the Giants aren't going to be able to do crap about it. And you could see how Leonard Williams and O'Shane Zimenez are aware of it. Leonard Williams gets a beat on it right away and he goes right lateral and goes to undercut it. But that was a mistake. And O'Shane Zimenez is getting held a little bit. I'm not sure if if that prevented him from locating CD Lamb, but it does appear like it might have impeded him somewhat. And I got to say something else about Dallas. These these wide receivers block their ass off. Like they just clear yeah, out that side of the field and Cordell Flott, who shows some pretty good closing bursts, makes the tackle from the backside of the field. But 12 yards on the first play is not good for the defense. I did agree with you. I, I like that observation about Flott's like closing burst there from the other side of the field starts. It gets us into a, a first and 10 here. Giants are actually coming out with two high safeties on this one. They have five men on the line of scrimmage and, uh, Here's Dak Prescott just kind of this is a good example of how he does a really good job sometimes of reading the hot, reading the hot route, reading where the blitz is coming from, processing it fast and then getting the ball out to CD Lamb. Yeah, I was wondering if that was tipped, but I don't believe it was the Giants trying to dictate with their pressure. You could see Kayvon Thibodeau from the from the left side drops off the screen, handles the tight end and then Darnay Holmes blitzes from the right, the defensive right. But that leaves CD Lamb open. Dak Prescott confirms it. Let's see if Darnay Holmes tips his hand 
in the beginning of the play. So you have a stack over here to the field side. And Darnay Holmes doesn't see, yeah, Darnay Holmes kind of positions himself like he's going to blitz. You don't see anything like the wide receiver pointing it out. But Dak Prescott yeah. quickly sees it and fires a quick hitch to CD Lamb for a nice gain of eight yards on first and 10. And look and at Tavon Kibbutt moving around. Yeah, yeah. It was a good tackle, by the way, by Julian Love here, because if he doesn't make that tackle, there might be a seam for Lamb. Yeah, Julian Love, he's just has to be everywhere now because Xavier McKinney is not yeah. out there, which is truly unfortunate. So it sets up a second and two here. Uh, Cowboys staying aggressive here with a play action play call, but here we go. You have an excellent pass rush here from Kayvon Thibodeau. His first flash of the game here gets in, gets the hit on Dak, but just an incredible ball from Dak Prescott here. I mean, under pressure to put this ball where he puts it is special, but luckily for the Giants, it's dropped. And you can see the Giants are continuing to roll out this tight front. Five guys on the line of scrimmage, both of the edge guys outside of the outermost. And this type of front with the four eye being Jihad Ward to Kayvon Thibodeau's side is going to force the tackle to block down or block, I should say, Jihad Ward, which is going to create that one on one matchup. Play action does not fool Kayvon Thibodeau whatsoever. You can see Kayvon Thibodeau get both of his hands on Dalton Schultz, push him back, and then he quickly diagnoses that this is a play action pass. Great time to call play action pass on a second and short. So he just uses his very, very impressive, in my opinion, explosiveness and burst to get right into the pocket and just smack Dak Prescott. Yeah. First quarterback hit of the game. What did you think of this throw? The, the throw is good. The throw is on target, but Darnay Holmes just kind of makes CD or looks like CD Lamb kind of fumbles it before Holmes even makes contact with the ball. Right. And then Darnay Holmes kind of fights through the catch point to, to force this incompletion. But this is kind of a crazy throw right here from Dak Prescott because it is on that far hash. And it goes outside right. the numbers and is placed really well in man coverage with Kayvon Thibodeau running right at you. So very nice throw by him. Yeah, far hash outside the numbers with a with a linebacker like Thibodeau bearing down on you. And you know you got to take the hit. So it didn't work. They set up this third and two situation. And the Giants come out with a look that you're going to see at times throughout this game, a cover zero look. And obviously you can see Kayvon Thibodeau once again get to him. This was one of, I thought, uh, Probably Dak's biggest misses. He missed a lot more in the first half than the second half. But it's, again, it's not the easiest throw to make while you're under pressure. But this one, I think, is one that he wishes he could have had back because he had, he diagnosed it, right? Right? Like, he saw that it was cover zero. He read it. He read it perfectly and fast to get it before the pressure comes. So he knew he had the wide open middle of the field, but he just places it a little out ahead of Gallup here. And Gallup, to me, doesn't have – like, I'm not – I'll be honest with you, Nick. I agree with what you said earlier about the hands catches, but I wasn't too overly impressed watching Gallup on tape. I think he's a – a tick slow. He doesn't look overly explosive here. Out of his break, he, he I feel like it's pretty good. And then Nick McLeod kind of grabs him at that moment, which if he threw his arms up, he might have got the call because it seemed to True. impede him. But yeah, he's, he's not the most explosive player out there on the football field, not like C.D. Lamb. But watch Dak Prescott's eyes, and we'll be able to well, first watch it from this angle because you're going to see Dalton Schultz. He's going to chip Kayvon Thibodeau and then release. And Dak Prescott's eyes go in that direction first. But then he diagnosis that Jason Pinnock came down to match Dalton Schultz. So then he knows he has that middle of the field wide open and it is truly cover zero. And that's when he decided to fire the deep post to Michael Gallup. We'll see it on this angle. Goes into the play action. Eyes go right to the flat. I'm going to throw it to Dalton Schultz, who's going to be open. Oh, wait, 27's coming down. That means the middle of the field is open. Now let me just transition under pressure and fire it to the post. He right. just missed it. So the throw isn't on target, even though he's getting hit. But from a processing standpoint, that's a lot to process right there coming off of a play action pass. With a free rusher, Thibodeau, coming down on you. I mean, he doesn't even – it's it's so fast processing-wise that he pumps the, the ball to that and doesn't even have time to reset his feet or anything to make that throw. It's partially why the throw was off target. Yeah, look at where his feet is or oriented. His feet are oriented not where he's throwing the football. Like, this is kind of like a, oh, crap, I'm about to get hit throw. And that's, like you said, primary reason why it is off target. But let's talk about Kayvon Thibodeau for a second because on this rush, he chips – Dalton Schultz and physically just pushes him outside. And then nobody picks up Kayvon Thibodeau. And I think Kayvon Thibodeau was forced to make a decision. Do I go around Henry Mondo, who is getting good depth into the pocket, but engaged with Tyler Smith, or do I undercut him and attempt to beat this guard to his set point to pick me up after I was chipped? And he decides to undercut because it's a more direct path to Dak Prescott. And then he ends up beating the guard 66 
into the backfield and getting a nice little quarterback hit on Dak Prescott. Kind of stumbles a little bit at that moment, though, when he's in the uh, backfield, kind of crossing by the guard. That was a good point, though, by you. I like that observation. That was quick processing on the fly by Thibodeau, and he chose the right path. The other path wouldn't have gotten there, and it might have given Dak enough time to reset his feet and make this throw, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. I think little plays like this are the other type of plays that Wink Martindale's referring to. He's the can opener. He does all the little things right, all the cliches, but he gets to set his feet. If he goes around Mondu here, he definitely gets to set his feet, and this could have been a long touchdown pass to Michael Gallup. But instead, yeah. he doesn't get to set his feet, and it's an incomplete pass. Also, credit to Mondu, who does a good job just kind of pushing Tyler Smith, allowing Kayvon Thibodeau to loop right inside to the B-gap. And that sets us up for this fourth and two decision early on by Mike McCarthy. He decides to go for it. Comes out with this heavy personnel package here. Uh, I Again, I just don't understand why you're running up the middle to the strength of the Giants defense, but they did. And the whole defense really holds up here and does a good job. Thibodeau, McLeod. You even see, uh, you know, Jalen Smith get right into the gap. It's not necessarily a, a run up the gut. This is a still not a, up the gut, but it's a D gap run. Technically, you have two tight ends right next to the play side tackle. One of them is off the line of scrimmage. And really, Kayvon Thibodeau kind of makes this play, even though he doesn't get the tackle. But Dallas, like you said, everything is condensed. Their splits are very, very tight. And they're in an I formation under center. So a fullback is going to go right to the play side, which is right off of Kayvon Thibodeau's ass. But watch Kayvon Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau explodes into the C-gap, takes his tight end with him, and then he picks the fullback. And this allows Jalen Smith to jump right around Kayvon Thibodeau and fill the desired hole of Ezekiel Elliott. And it creates kind of a two versus one against this other tight end, number 89, because Nick McLeod pinches really tight, keeps everything tight to force Ezekiel Elliott and contain him back inside. Right to Jalen Smith, who the fullback was supposed to kick out, but the fullback was picked off by Kayvon Thibodeau. Again, not a play that's going to gain any stats for Thibodeau, but a very, very smart play that ends up working out for the New York Giants. Yep. And that sets up, um, you know, it sets up the fourth down stop. And the next drive for the Cowboys, which we're about to get up, is going to be a five play. 32 yard drive here. This one ends in the interception that Nick was referencing earlier where Darius Williams made a good read, jumped it. The pressure also played a big role in my mind and why that was able to be an interception, but the Cowboys were rolling at that point. It was the second and six when they threw that interception. So it ends up being a massive, you know, game altering play that gives the giants an opportunity to keep a lead in the first half. And, and obviously, you know, the second half wasn't great, but it gave them a chance to stay in the game. It starts this drive, though, with a 15-yard run here uh, by Ezekiel Elliott, where this is just a really good, powerful run by Elliott. Elliott is not, in my mind, anywhere close to the runner. He was when he first burst down from the scene. His burst is nothing like it used to be. He doesn't have anywhere. He used to have breakaway speed. He doesn't have that anymore. He doesn't force many missed tackles in open space, but he can still break break tackles in open space and that's just by running tough through like arm tackles like you'll see on this one and he is a cautionary tale for anyone who wants to extend a running back if I'm going to be honest about the situation because the Cowboys right now would be a much better team if they didn't have his contract and they just had Pollard and a veteran or Pollard and a rookie and they were able to spend that money on positions they actually need to improve but he is you know he had a decent game in this one I thought and and um you know you can see here he's tough through the tackle very tough through Leonard Williams tackle, but there was a missed clip, in my opinion, right there on Zach Martin. Jalen Smith, to his credit, does a good job. You're saying the hole. Oh, yeah. Watch. He just pins Jalen Smith right there. Like, that's that's a penalty. Right. So Jalen Smith actually positions himself well to eliminate this cutback lane. Zach Martin's so quick to climb, which is good on Zach Martin to put himself in that position. But it's at this moment when he pins Jalen Smith to the back of Dexter Lawrence. That's the. That, pure block in the back. Leonard Williams though, still has has the chance to make this tackle on Ezekiel Elliott, but Elliott just runs right through the arm tackle. This ends up going for 15 yards to start the drive. So the, so the Cowboys have started two drives with a 12-yard rush from C.D. Lamb and a 15-yard rush from Ezekiel Elliott. And they did it in different ways, different kinds of runs too. One, you know, one power gap or, you know, one with that end around. And so here you'll see, uh, is this the penalty play or no? This was after the this penalty. The after the penalty. Yeah, so right after the penalty, you just get a little PA boundary rollout here from Dak Prescott to his opposite shoulder to his left, and he does a good job of just finding that slide tight end. This time it's it's uh, Jake Ferguson, my boy, the rookie out of Wisconsin, connects with him for a big a big gain here because um, it was a uh, 13-yarder. And the penalty was a hold against Zach Martin on Leonard Williams. So the Dallas Cowboys get in this first and 20 situation. Look at the linebackers play. 
overly aggressive to stop the run. And Jake Ferguson, nobody picks him up at all on this play. It's just you have two tight ends right now to the to the field side. And Jake Ferguson is the innermost tight end. And he releases underneath. I believe that's Julian Love who gets picked by Micah McFadden. And that's kind of why this happens because Michael McFadden and Jalen Smith are both playing the run, the play action side of it. And if you watch Julian Love, Julian Love isn't fooled. No one's fooled by Jake Ferguson's route, but Julian Love just gets picked by his own guy, runs right into Michael McFadden. And then Jake Ferguson runs out in space and makes this catch for a really good gain of 13 yards, just chunk, chunk plays. But Michael McFadden needs to be a little bit more aware and get out of the way. And I actually felt thought this was a better game for Michael McFadden, but little plays like this are still kind of annoying. Yep, exactly. This play was a run up the middle here. Again, a, a tough run here by Ezekiel Elliott to kind of go through. You know, he fights through some arm contacts some some potential arm tackles here and just kind of gets through for a seven-yard gain and a first down. It was a second and seven. Nice run by Ezekiel Elliott. The Cowboys motion C.D. Lamb to the back of 12 personnel. So it looks like this could be some sort of outside run. Ezekiel Elliott just finds a cutback lane. And if you just look at that block by Zach Martin on a double team on Leonard Williams. And this is when the Giants attempt to slant, right? And we talked a lot about slanting over the last couple of weeks. They try to slant and penetrate, but that just allows this double team to just shove Leonard Williams' hip. Watch how Zach Martin gets to the hip. And then it gives Terrence Steele a clear climb right up to 54 and it's going to be on Ocean Zimenez to make that tackle, which is difficult. He's engaged in a block, but it's a tight end. But he's closing, closing, closing. And Ezekiel runs right through that arm tackle. And then this is just another pretty nice gain and a first down for the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, you'll see another example of that later where slanting goes wrong. Sets up a first and 10, four-yard run. Love makes the tackle. Yeah, Julian Love, one of the most unsung players on this New York Giants team over the last several years. He gets engaged right near the box with Dalton Schultz, who didn't have his best blocking day. But again, 12 personnel, field side, and Dak Prescott hands the football right off to Tony Pollard. But he doesn't really have anywhere to go because Dalton Schultz can't overpower Julian Love. Julian Love keeps that outside arm free. Look how low Julian Love gets into contact here and just kind of sets this edge. And he has Nick McLeod, who's actually out there on the edge. But just keep this extra rushing gap very, very narrow and allow yourself to come off and make this tackle. And he does. And also Jalen Smith gets himself into position, doesn't get really too aggressive and get close to the line of scrimmage as he is pursuing Tony Pollard. He keeps his eyes on Pollard. You can see him stop there, see if the cutback, because look how wide that cutback lane is, has to protect that, right? Tony Pollard isn't even looking at the cutback lane. So, so Jalen Smith just gets himself right into the gap where the run was going to be. And he assists with tackling. He assists on the tackle with Julian Love. And I think in this game, at least, you saw some of the limitations that we saw in past years with Shane Zimenez, Zimenez as a run defender. I mean, it's not like he's a major liability by any means, but he just doesn't do a great job, in my mind, getting off blocks. He doesn't make too many penetration plays in the run game. He's just, to me, not uh, almost non-existent player in the Giants run game. And I think that that could be a nice area for them to improve on when Ojolari comes back into the lineup and replaces Zimenez for a lot of the snaps Zimenez has had, because I think Ojolari is a much better run defender. Yeah. And it's something that Ojolari struggled with last season, but he put on what, like 15 pounds or something uh, ridiculous in the off season. And a little bit that we saw of him this year, he looked to be improved. So I'm personally looking forward to seeing number five out there with Aziz Ojolari. And hopefully that can allow Kayvon Thibodeau to feast. And Ojolari was just activated for practice off of the IR. So that's definitely uh, possible reinforcements coming to this New York Giants defense. And as you're watching on the screen, Rodarius Williams intercepts Dak Prescott on a far hash throw. Dexter Lawrence has one of his biggest impact plays in the game in terms of his pass rush. He splits a double team and gets right into Dak Prescott's face facilitating this throw. Yeah, I think that's part of the reason why he threw this interception because he had to get rid of the ball faster than he wanted to because of Dexter Lawrence. Yeah, Dexter Lawrence, I mean... The guard opens up towards Kayvon Thibodeau. Dexter Lawrence easily gets to the half man, like right off the snap against Tyler Biotis and then lands the rip move and just gets skinny through the hole. Like Dexter Lawrence is 345 pounds. Watch how skinny he gets through the hole. That's very narrow. Yeah. And there were a lot of reps in this game where he was double teamed, by the way. This is not a true double team, but there were a lot of reps in this game, especially in the run game where they double teamed Lawrence. It was definitely part of their game plan. And it's a good read, and it's a good jump by Rodarius Williams to set up the interception here. And here's the play from the sideline angle by Rodarius Williams. Watch how patient he is and calm. 
Right now, at this point, because you have this defender who's contacting C.D. Lamb, the apex defender, who's going to flash his eyes and look for anything coming over the middle of the field. So Rodarius Williams has to midpoint the number one and the number two, but you also have a safety coming over the top. It's a too high defense, but watch how Rodarius Williams just midpoints both these players. He has his eyes on C.D. Lamb, and then he can look through C.D. Lamb right at Dak Prescott, and he sees Dak Prescott go back to throw to the outside, and he jumps the throw and just intercepts what would have been a comeback route to Michael Gallup. So I'm sure Dak Prescott looked at this coverage, saw the deep safeties, and then saw that Rodarius Williams was midpointing. He was basically between the number one and the number two. So we thought he could hit a back shoulder throw to Michael Gallup, but Rodarius Williams read it very well, broke on the football, got both feet in bounds. And now it's the Giants ball. It's time for the New York Giants offense to get something going. Unfortunately, they ended up going three and out. Yep. And so that sets up the Cowboys' next drive, which is the one they finally strike on. This is an 11-play, 93-yard touchdown drive. So it was a very, you know, not demoralizing because at that point the Giants still had the lead, I believe, or they got the lead right back. But it was a long drive for a touchdown. It starts off here with um, a good play here on a four-yard run. Love and McFadden and Smith all get involved on this one. Yeah, they all spin off their blocks. And I felt like the linebackers, they weren't, terrible in this game. Like I said a little earlier, Michael McFadden might have had a better game than than he has had in the past. And here's one of the plays that I think I'm referring to because he gets engaged with 66 and then he spins right off. And that's an offensive guard who's climbing, has basically has a free release to the second level. He stabs Lawrence a little bit, but he engages Michael McFadden. You see 41 should be washed, but he feels the leverage of the guard and then spins inside to free himself up. And you can see how many New York Giants end up getting in position to make this tackle. But look at what happens to number 71, Justin Ellis. And this is one of the plays where if like, if, <laughs> if a New York Giant blocker did this, we would be talking extensively about it. And this is Tyler Smith along with 87 there, a tight end. So he gets help from a tight end, but geez, Justin Ellis, get, Ellis gets uprooted here. This could have been incredibly dangerous. Like I think I'm done seeing 71 out there. The Giants de desperately need somebody else on the defensive line to take snaps away from Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams. They want to keep those guys fresh down the stretch because 71 just, he's supposed to be this run defender, but I've seen over the weeks, this type of stuff happen to him. It's, it's not pretty. Yeah, he's not a great run defender, despite that supposed to be a specialty. I think we'll see less of Ellis down the stretch run, especially because Mondu looks considerably better. But that's not just any tight end, Nick. That was Jake Ferguson. Oh, who's that? What school did he go to? Yeah, Wisconsin. Where they <laughs> teach you how to block like that on every single snap, in addition to what he can do as a receiver. So showing some more love for my boy from Wisconsin. But even though he's a cowboy, that part sucks. They've been drafting a lot of Wisconsin guys lately. But it sets up a second and six. Uh, Cowboys try to run again to just a two yard run here because Dexter Lawrence does an incredible job as we've seen throughout the season of working down the line of scrimmage laterally watch 97. He's aligned as a two technique and the Cowboys have 13 personnel. They ran a lot of 12 and 13 personnel packages out there, despite the fact that they have some talented receivers and they motion the backside tight end to the double Y set. And Dexter Lawrence just runs through a double team to get to Tony Pollard to limit this to a two-yard game. But I want everyone to pay attention to Kayvon Thibodeau, who's engaged with one of these tight ends and ends up getting chipped by the H-back who was motioning from the other side of the formation. So Kayvon Thibodeau, several times in this game, has to fight through multiple blocks. But watch how he's still able to stay on the edge and not allow Tony Pollard to bounce outside. Watch how he gets his hands back on this tight end, sets outside, sets the edge, forces Tony Pollard back inside where Julian Love, Jalen Smith... Henry Mondo and Dexter Lawrence are, and there's really no rushing room for Tony Pollard here. Great individual play by Kayvon Thibodeau and obviously Dexter Lawrence. And that'll set up a third and four situation. Giants get Dallas into a third down situation. But as you mentioned earlier, this is one of the examples of a nice catch in tight coverage. Dak throws into tight coverage here, puts the ball high away from his frame. Gives the receiver a chance to make a play on this to convert the third down. And that's exactly what Michael Gallup does. The coverage is fine, as Nick referenced earlier. You're going to see on some of these plays. But quarterback gives him a chance. He throws it high and away from the frame. And that's all that is really needed here to convert. Very tight. Nick McLeod is all over. And he's in press coverage. He doesn't really lose outside. You can see how he's on top of Michael Gallup's row. He's, he's able to swivel his hips back around. And Gallup does a good job kind of staying in front of him. But... A lot of times you see this when the defender has that type of coverage, he can just knock the ball out, but it's just a very right. strong handed play. And you'll see it a little bit better from this angle. 
Like, watch, he hits the ball, Nick McLeod, right. with his yeah. left hand, and it doesn't matter because Gallup holds onto it. And if we watch the blitz, remember, this is a third and four situation. The Giants send Jason Pinnock, and Tony Pollard does a good job kind of picking him up. And then they also just take Dexter Lawrence, who's a nose. They use him slanting left. Leonard Williams slants to the left. That opens up that B gap with Kayvon Thibodeau taking Tyler Smith high side for Jason Pinnock because the Giants end up dropping Jihad Ward off the line of scrimmage. But what else do they do? They use O'Shane Zimenez in some manner to come across the formation. And I'm wondering if O'Shane was going to loop, if he was looking to undercut one of these backside routes, because we've seen over the last couple of weeks, Dan, O'Shane Zimenez loop from the complete opposite side of the formation, like from his left all the way to his right. It's a long distance to do, but it worked on that third and eight, right? With the New York Giants when against the Lions, but he ended up taking the penalty. So a lot right. of movement here from the Giants defenders to to confuse and try to get a free rusher in on Dak Prescott. But Prescott releases the football, and it's just a good catch by Gallup. Now first and 10, you'll see another example of where, you know, slanting can go wrong here with Dexter Lawrence. The Giants are trying to get aggressive, and it leads to kind of an easy seven-yard hole, uh, a hole for a seven-yard run. Yeah. Who's that? Pinnock comes up and runs support. But watch how Jihad Ward... Tries to slant to his right. So does Dexter Lawrence. And then you have the linebackers go to play this with Jalen Smith blitzing. He gets picked up by the tight end. Micah McFadden gets chipped at the second level by Zach Martin. And it's just on Jason Pinnock and Julian Love to come down from their two high spots and make this tackle. And actually Pinnock really is able to do it. Pinnock. It is. Pinnock, I see him taking a lot. For a big gain if it wasn't for this. I feel like Pinnock took a lot of strays online and it's mainly because he had two really negative plays in the second half, but there are plays like this where I'm like, I could see why the giants are giving this guy snaps obviously because of injury, but he's physical, he's long, he's big, and he's pretty solid in run support, all things considered. Yeah. And that's probably why they're playing it right now, especially over someone like Landon Collins. We expected to play a little bit more sets up a second and three here where the Cowboys do a good job. Uh, try, or, sorry. The giants do a good job of, as we've seen times this season, a tight end trying to block Jihad Ward on the edge, that's a win for the Giants almost all the time. It typically is, and I hope that teams continue to do that. That's mainly the upside of Jihad Ward on this roster. He doesn't yes. offer much as a pass rusher. His upside is when he aligns as an edge and the offense has to use a tight end to block him, he typically wins that matchup. And we see it right here as he just bench presses this tight end, Dalton Schultz, off of him and tackles Tony Pollard for no gain. Sets up a third and three situation. Another strong catch in tight coverage. This time it was Cordell Flott in coverage. The Cowboys run like a little double slant action here. And they go back to Gallup. But I guess he trusts at times when the Giants try to take away Lamb. And another high throw away from the frame. Again, good coverage here, as you guys can see, if you're watching along on YouTube. But just a really tough catch. Flott has his hand right basically on the wrist of Michael Gallup has his arm wrapped around the hip. I don't <clears throat> necessarily think it was interference or anything, but it's very tight coverage. Just a pinpoint perfect throw from Dak Prescott and good coverage by flop. But sometimes the receivers win these types of matchups. You can see how Dallas too, man, they'll, they'll use that receiver or is that Tony Pollard running from the backside, confirm the coverage giants are in man. They have a safety deep, just double slant. Jalen Smith tries to undercut the number two. You can see how C.D. Lamb's able to press Darnay Holmes off him and went inside, but the Giants had a rat in the hole with Jalen Smith there. And it looks like Gallup just fights through contact of Flot, and Flot just can't get his hand on the football. Yeah, long developing drive right here with two third and short conversions. It sets up a first and 10 pay, play action boot here where they just try to get a quick hitter to Gallup using the leverage. Good throw outside the hashes by, by Dak Prescott. It's an and insane throw, man. This is an insane throw. Dak Prescott is on the move off the play action, similar to like what the Giants do a lot. And he throws this football because Nick McLeod realizes what's happening pretty, pretty shortly after the snap. And he comes down and Dak Prescott puts this only where Michael Gallup can catch this. If this True. throw was to the numbers on, on the 13 of Gallup, this is going to get picked off, possibly a pick six. But this throw is all the way outside. Gallup has to adjust his route to run outside, but 
if oh man, that is a, that is an impressive impressive throw right there from Dak Prescott. Let's from see that from play. the end zone angle real quick. I just want to see how that throw looks from that angle. You're right though. This is a really freaking good throw. And people will look at this and be like, how can you call a five yard? How could you get that ecstatic about a five yard throw? But it's what you said, Nick. It's the ball placement. I mean, again, if you throw that anywhere else, it's picked or or tipped at best. This has to be exactly right. like that's a crazy throw right there. And Gallup does a good job getting both of his feet, toe drag, swag. And again, these young giant cornerbacks, they're they're in position to make plays. It's just sometimes tough catches, strong hands, and pinpoint accuracy is going to bail the offense out despite, I would say, solid coverage. Now, the coverage breaks down in the second half, but so far in the game, it's not like the Giants are, are getting burnt or anything like that. No, they showed up and they played big. Here are the second five, three-yard gain. Again, Dexter Lawrence is the guy to focus on. 97, as usual. Jeez. Does a good job of stacking the lineman and then just shedding him and getting right in the running lane. Watch how quick his hands are to get onto the center's breastplate. It's such a difficult matchup for centers to snap the football and then have to engage right. Dexter Lawrence in a block. And he bench presses Tyler Biotish and then just sheds him and just crashes right down into the A-gap. Still, even though the Cowboys were able to rush the football well, the A-gap with Dexter Lawrence is still a very, very precarious spot to enter. So third and two here, Cowboys in the gun. It's a really interesting, good play call and design by Kellen Moore. Yeah. They run, they come out here with an option play, which Giants haven't seen, but they also have Dalton Schultz on the outside providing, you know, somebody who can, I guess, pin down the, the Shane Ziminens, which he does a really good job of. That's actually a really good block by Schultz. Now that I'm looking at the position yeah, where he was before the yeah. snap. Yeah, you're right, but it's a bad play by Oshin Zimenez. Like it you is can't a bad play by Oshin Zimenez. You're the contained defender. You have right. unless Julian Why is he Love, going back inside there? I'm not sure if there's a miscommunication. If if there's something in the Giants' defense where Julian Love is the quarterback on an option, and and maybe I don't I don't know if one of them didn't process the fact that it was an option play. If there are option wow. rules built into the defense, or if. Yep. Julian Love had contain, and that doesn't make any sense for Julian Love to have no. contain here. This is on O'Shane. O'Shane Zimenez goes outside initially, engages the block, and then sees Dak Prescott with the football running towards him in a third and short situation. And, and he just like maybe forgets he... about Zeke. It's crazy. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's a terrible play by O'Shane Zimenez, and it's the reason why Ezekiel Elliott scampered for a 20-plus yard gain. This is 2022. It's not 2016, you know? Ezekiel Elliott doesn't really break off a lot of 20-plus yard runs, but O'Shane Zimenez removed himself from the play, and there was no one there to make the tackle at all. Look at all that space. Yeah, great play again by Schultz, too, because he, he comes up eventually and gets rid of Julian Love on this play as well. But like, like you said, this yeah, right. is on Zimenez. He has to contain there. That's a great block by Schultz off the chip, you know, like he got helped out and bailed out by Oshane Zimenez trying to undercut, but then he climbs and just knocks Julian Love on his ass. Right. That's a very, very impressive play. I think he even gets another defender. I think he gets Jalen Smith. Let's see. Turn this into the Dalton Schultz hour. Now he goes back at Julian Love, no, knocks him down twice. Love, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Julian, you okay? I know, I know Notre Dame lost to USC this way. A tough weekend for Julian Love, I guess. This is a tough mental error though from Shane Zimenez because if he just contains here, the Giants might stop this play. Now, they'll probably go for it, but they might stop this play. Instead, the result is a 22-yard explosive play. So it's a really bad play here by O'Shane that, that hurts the Giants in a lot of ways here. But it sets up a first in right position to, to take Dak Prescott. So there's no reason to put yourself in that same position. I know Leonard Williams has the double team, and he's not there, but everybody's accounted for except Ezekiel Elliott. So it's it's tough. That's a tough one. Yep. Sets up a first and 10 here. Giants come out, as you'll see in the sideline view, a quarters look, which they've run a lot this year when they're not in cover one. It feels like that's what they primarily run. This is just a long developing route by CD lamb and Dak has enough time in the pocket and just delivers a really good ball here. This is a tough, this is a tough play to watch on film. Yeah. Nick, just because we never have these, like when do we ever have a play like this on offense? I don't think I can think of one. Well, Let's look at the the route combination because there's so much brilliance in this yeah. route combination to set up CD Lamb. First off, CD Lamb motions from a from a bunch to be the lone receiver outside the numbers with also a tight end on that side. So you basically have a two by two set. Now let's look at CD Lamb's route because remember quarters covered. So in order to hit a in breaking route, you have to manipulate that that safety to the to the side where you're throwing to. So if you look at CD Lamb's route first. He's going to run a corner post and watch how he gets into Nick McLeod's blind spot about like 20 yards down the field to really eat into the leverage and open up Nick McLeod. 
And then you look at that play side safety, Jason Pinnock. What do the Cowboys do? What does Kellen Moore, Moore call? He calls just a seam route that bends right towards Pinnock to clear him out. So he has to pay attention to Dalton Schultz. Now you combine the stem and the route manipulation of CD Lamb with the route of Dalton Schultz. And what do you have? You have a throwing window, a wide open throwing window right there where that deep fourth safety was supposed to be, but he was cleared out by another route. That's just excellent play call, True. excellent route running against this specific coverage that the Giants ran. And if he wanted it, he didn't because he had that. But if he wanted it, he also has Michael Gallup coming wide open here, like a drag route where the Giants just like have another coverage breakdown at the second level and just leave him wide open. Yeah, it's, I think because of Micah McFadden, it looks like Jalen Smith makes the under call to Micah McFadden, but Micah McFadden's stuck on the seam route of Dalton Schultz. And you're right. He would have had a wide open play to Michael Gallup that would have went for at least 20 yards, but you know, take, take what's there. This is just an, yeah. like, I can't even get over this route, man. Cause it's outward stem by, by CD lamb. And then he breaks right there, right into the blind spot to just open up the throwing window because right. he knows Nick McLeod is going to fade and try to push him onto the red line and use the sideline to his advantage. And then he breaks back inside. Like CD lamb is just a phenomenal route runner, man. And if McFadden just breaks out left there, like if he flips his hips left, he might get in the throwing lane, but that wasn't part of his responsibility there. And it doesn't happen. Here's the touchdown run right after it. It's another example of what Nick talked about earlier. Justin Ellis really struggling as a run defender for the Giants. They run a trap and they just destroy him. Yeah, I mean, it's a snatch and trap. It's not a trap play, but Justin Ellis goes and leans into contact and Terrence Steele just does a really good job catching him leaning and just tosses him on the ground and then kind of falls on top of him. And Zach Martin has basically no one he has to chip. He doesn't have to chip Ellis. You don't have to respect Ellis. Terrence Steele can handle that. Even though Ellis is aligned as a four eye shade, Terrence Steele can still handle that. So what does that do? That gives Zach Martin a free climb right up to Micah McFadden where he just blocks Micah McFadden and Ezekiel Elliott takes him. Just a gigantic hole for Dallas. Yep. So that's a touchdown for the Cowboys. Sets up their fourth drive. The Giants fight back here on their fourth drive and force a three and out. This is kind of the Kayvon Thibodeau drive for me. This was a just dominant drive by one player for the Giants. One of the most dominant single possessions I've seen by a Giants defender all year, with the exception of maybe Dexter Lawrence. And he's had a few Dexter Lawrence. I don't know if he's had one where it's been a three and out and all three plays are impacted by Dexter Lawrence. Maybe, though. It's possible. But you start here with the, with the Cowboys trying to run PA bootleg, which they had a little bit of success with earlier, and they found um, Schultz on the slide. But this time, Kayvon Thibodeau, not fooled at all, reacts super fast to this and gets right into the throwing lane and, and kind of forces a, a, a you know, throw out of bounds from Dak. Kid's just smart, man. He knows where to be and what offenses are trying to do. He sees how this tight end, who is the sniffer, 89, coming across the formation, makes no contact on him. So you can see, Kayvon Thibodeau is embracing himself for contact, or maybe he's going to undercut it, but he sees that the tight end deliberately avoids Kayvon Thibodeau. So he knows it's a play action. So right at this moment, he adjusts his route. You see how he's going flat, and he adjusts his route and gets to the point where Dak Prescott's going to roll out towards, and this forces an incomplete pass. That's a very smart play, very quick processing type of play from Kayvon Thibodeau, which is consistent with his game because he is one damn smart player. That's a great observation. Once that tight end doesn't make contact, you know you can have the free reign to go right after the quarterback. Second and 10, two-yard throw to the flat to, to Pollard. Once again, the Giants kind of put the Cowboys in a tough spot here with a two against one against Tyler Smith, and it leads to Kayvon Thibodeau getting a quarterback hit. Yeah, Kayvon Thibodeau comes in free. I like the fact that the Giants, they only bring five guys, but the way they align these five guys and the way Justin Ellis releases from his one shade engages number 66, which creates the one-on-one -on -one if Tony Pollard doesn't stay in for protection. He doesn't. Dak Prescott quickly deciphers this and finds Pollard in the flat, but Jalen Smith is all over him to make the tackle for, like you said, only a two-yard game. But that's one good thing, man. When you release that one shade into that guard and you have a four or a five technique with a wide rusher and the running back doesn't stay into protection, what's going to happen? The tackle is going to get out scheme one versus one, and he's going to have to remove the most dangerous man. So he does. That's Jihad Ward because he's going inside, whereas Kayvon Thibodeau is going around. Thibodeau hits Dak, but Dak does Dak things, gets rid of the football really quickly. Let's watch Jalen Smith, who I felt like had some good movement plays throughout this game, how he just matches right on to Tony Pollard. See how he breaks down right here to see if there's going to be some sort of in-breaking route. Then he see he points to the inside as well, like there might be. And then he just goes and just clamps right down on that hip, makes a nice tackle out of bounds. Sets up a third and eight. Once again, the Giants on this third and eight will come out with a cover zero type look. Big time seven-man pressure. And once again, 
you'll see Kayvon Thibodeau get in on the quarterback and force a little bit of an overthrow here. This was one of the misses I was talking about earlier. I mean, it is close to not even being a miss here, too. Like, this is about a yard, maybe. And he, if he, you know, he's got a step on him, C.D. Lamb here. Uh, so just a slightly overthrown ball in a large part due to the pressure by Kayvon Thibodeau. It covers zero. You can see Pinnock pre-snap looks like he is the middle of the field safety, but Darnay Holmes blitzes, so he has to match C.D. Lamb in space. Tough assignment. The throw is to C.D. Lamb. Dak Prescott, good job getting rid of the football with seven guys coming down on you, and we could watch the, the blitz from Kayvon Thibodeau. Giants are in a tight front. Jalen Smith's going to go right into the A gap, which is going to force Pollard up there, and then Darnay Holmes is going to be that unblocked defender because no one can account for him. You can see how Tyler Smith kicks out for Kayvon Thibodeau, Kayvon Thibodeau gets the rip move, and I feel like he's held up a little bit on this play. If you watch here, Kayvon Thibodeau, on this third step, he just orients right towards that outside shoulder, goes for the double swipe, kind of misses, but then just quickly brings that inside arm through the outside armpit of Tyler Smith. And look at Tyler Smith at this point. His hips are turned. He's leaning. He has his hands contacted with Cave on Thibodeau's chest, but he has no actual control. And I think at this point is when he's holding. His, his hips are completely flipped. Right. And it's like he's clotheslining Cave on Thibodeau. And you could just see how his momentum is halted at this moment right here, Dan. It looks like there's just some sort of quick hold that might have negated Cave on Thibodeau from hitting Dak Prescott when he possessed the football. But either way, it's still the Giants get off the football field because of the overthrow to CeeDee Lamb. That sets up the fifth drive of the game for the Cowboys. They actually get something moving here on this fifth drive, but it bogs down at the end when you have the play you were discussing earlier, the interception by Julian Love. Second interception of the half, second interception of the game. They also had a fourth down stop. A lot of big stops by the Giants on turnovers. Drive starts with a two-yard run here for Tony Pollard. Pollard gets the football. Giants do a good job. Justin Ellis makes a really good play, fighting through a double team and then just keeping Biotish off of him getting his shoulders turned at the line of scrimmage. You want to stay square, but he doesn't necessarily do that, but he's still able to assist in the tackle with Henry Mondo. The second and eight that it'll set up, it's another example of just a lot of options. We talked about earlier where Dak Prescott hit CeeDee Lamb on that deep break in breaker. Um, he could have also had another route there on that one. He could have had Gallup on the drag. This is another example where he had multiple options here because no one for the Giants, for some reason, picks up Tony Pollard off this play action. So he's wide open if the Cowboys want it. You'll see. Just watch the running back here off the play action. If they want it, they have that. And there's an insane amount of space. Instead, he's got something else he likes here. Um, and he just throws it right into, uh, I believe it was, was this one to Gallup? Yeah. Cordell Flott, I mean, he's aligned in inside leverage, too. With his hips a little bit oriented inside, it looks like he has some sort of inside leverage. Like You don't want to allow him to break inside. Dak Prescott is on the far hash throwing the football, so you want to force him outside. <laughs> Michael Gallup just gets an easy dig route right to the inside. It looks like Flott was just a little bit slow to break down and then transition. Easy pitching catch for the Dallas Cowboys. You're right, man. Tony Pollard was just wide open in the flat and also the giants have two defenders who just, given his explosiveness and breakaway ability it could have been a touchdown if he threw that to pollard in my mind oh easily yeah and i think the only defender who would have had a shot was cordell flot with right with michael gallup right there and watch how tay crowder and jalen smith run into each other like gotta be better than that boys <laughs> that's just embarrassing yep. not a great look first and 10 counter run here three yards good stop here by the giants defense tay crowder comes down and makes a physical play I feel like it was around this point of the game where Kellen Moore was like, we're going to start calling some counter runs, something the Giants have struggled with all season. But the Giants end up rallying pretty well at this point. Jihad Ward absorbs this kickout block from the backside guard. And then Tay Crowder does a really good job kind of filling and then just forcing Tony Pollard to think. He gets himself into the gap and then just engages Dalton Schultz. And Tony Pollard right at this moment is like, do I cut inside or do I bounce everything outside? Is Jihad Ward blocked? Is he kicked out? Is he going to get me if I go outside? So Tony Pollard has to think, and he decides to bounce outside, but then go back inside. And at that point, Julian Love is right in the gap from the backside to fill. Well broken down by you. Sets up a second and seven. Cowboys just do a good job here against cover three of attacking the off leverage from Flott. It's the 14-yard gain, and they'll take this every time with that kind of leverage. And this has happened a lot against the Giants defense this year where teams have just attacked their leverage. Yeah, I mean, when you run cover three, you're you're an off leverage quite often. And on this type of play, you're you're outside the numbers and the ball is on the far hash. So you don't really necessarily expect him to whip it like this. 
but it seems like Flott has been given a little bit too much cushion in the last couple plays that we've broken down. And he's that deep third defender. He has the deep third. And then you have a number two receiver to occupy the curl flat guy, which is Julian Love. So it's just an easy decision for Dak Prescott to hit, hit his back foot and fire the football in to Gallup for a solid game. And you mentioned the counter run. Well, they tried again on the first and 10 after that conversion. Leonard Williams blows this one up and it's only a one yard game. And Leonard Williams is one of the best players from the backside. Like he's always making plays from the backside. And here the Cowboys try to block down on him with the center and watch how he just uses his inside arm to just shove the center away and then bring his outside arm over the top. Just a quick little swim move against a run blocker. You can see the counter blocks. You have GT counter. So that means the guard and the tackle from the backside are going to be pulling. And that's exactly what happens here. 66 blocks down on Dexter Lawrence. You think you have something going. Pollard thinks he has his A gap, but great block or great play by Leonard Williams to fill that. Because if Leonard Williams doesn't do this, it's going to be Darnay Holmes against Tony Pollard, I think. Well, Jihad Ward looks like he won against, or it looks like Jihad Ward got, fell down against the double team and then no one accounted for him. So Jihad Ward probably would have made a tackle, actually. Second and nine situation after that. Good spot to get in as a defense. Giants get aggressive again, bring the pressure. Dak recognizes it fast and throws to Schultz for a five-yard gain. Dalton Schultz first catch of the game. He makes two touchdown catches a little bit later on. But yeah, he just notices that the pressure is coming and he just throws it to his quick quick option right here. I mean, look. He's a tough quarterback to pressure, Dak, because he just recognizes it so fast. He really is. And the Giants bring Darnay Holmes again. They they send Jalen Smith. There's just a lot of people coming. Dak Prescott quickly hits his back foot, finds Schultz. Pinnock is the player who's coming from depth to make the play on Schultz. Then there's a series of penalties, including the hold on Darnay Holmes, false start. Ultimately, we, we, we settle into a first and 15 here where the Cowboys try to run the ball, and you just see a good job of Jalen Smith kind of holding up at the point of contact, staying square, and that's that's why they're able to limit this a four yard gain. Look at this by Jalen Smith though. Like this is a very good play because you have the double team block right in front. And then the, well, you have two double team blocks because Noah Brown's in there with Nick McLeod, 87 climbs the, the tight end Ferguson up to Jalen Smith and Jalen Smith just uses his hands and just fends him off and just presents his chest right in the gap and just hits Ezekiel Elliott. Tay Crowder comes to rally. So that's a really nice play by Jalen Smith. Okay, it sets up a second and 11. This is usually a play I've seen the Giants run defense have trouble with because the Cowboys, after showing two counter runs early on the drive, run a fake counter and then actually hand it to the end around man, which is Pollard. But it's played really well by the Giants here. I think McLeod does the best job on this because he for he contains the run and forces it back inside. Yeah, he. I think the Giants probably called blitz, some sort of blitz here with McLeod because McLeod gets into the backfield and he sees how... Dalton Schultz first steps to his left. The play design is going to be to his right. Acts like he's pulling for the counter and then turns back and makes contact with McLeod unsuspectedly. And McLeod realizes that this is an end around. So he just gains depth and forces Pollard to cut back right towards Julian Love. He does not give him the edge. That's a smart play by McLeod. Four yard loss on the play to set up a third and 15 situation. This is the play Nick referenced earlier where it looks like it might be bracket coverage from Julian Love on CD Lamb. It's an interception for the Giants, and this is a big play for the defense to take points off the board. Yeah, if you look, the Cowboys are in this three-by-one set, and it looks like Dane Belton shades towards Michael Gallup, but then sees Dak Prescott's eyes go to the left. So he just darts towards the middle of the field just in case C.D. Lamb runs a seam, which is exactly what he does. But watch Julian Love. He gets outside the numbers. Looks like he might be anticipating some sort of deep route up the sideline or maybe a deep seven route from C.D. Lamb on this third and 15 play. But instead, C.D. Lamb just stays right on the seam. And Darnay Holmes has one of his better plays. He's beat, too. One of his better plays through the catch point to force this interception. And we'll watch it from the end zone angle as well. You can see Darnay Holmes' play on the football a little bit better there. But let's see. Yeah, I like the end zone angle look on this. Dak Prescott hits his back foot. The Giants only send four, and Pinnock stays on Ezekiel Elliott. But you have Kayvon Thibodeau get into the backfield and then get right to the feet of Dak Prescott. Let's watch the football. It's right there that doesn't get Darnay Holmes a penalty because he's grabbing and his head isn't turned around. This could have been a penalty, but then he gets his head around, which I feel like negated the, the penalty that could have been called and then just tips the football in the air right to Love, who was there. So I like this play 
by Wink Martindale on the defense. And also Kayvon Thibodeau just uses power. This is a power rush from Kayvon Thibodeau. We haven't talked too much about bull rushes from KT that were successful, but he kind of runs through Smith here and Smith gets all the way back on his heels yeah. and the guard has to come and help him. And as the guard kind of pushes KT down, it rolls him right towards Prescott's feet. Prescott's feet. Wow. That's a very Arizona thing of me to do. There's a town out here, Dan called Prescott is what we would call it, but it's actually pronounced Prescott and they are like very, very anal about that. Like if you were to go there and say Prescott, they would be like, actually it's Prescott and be all pretentious about it. It's a nice little town though. I do like this observation though, because you can see this bull rush lifts Smith off his feet and knocks him back one, two, three, four steps into the lap of Dak. And that doesn't allow him to follow through on the throw. He has to kind of throw this from basically he's like on balance, but he's not able to step into the throw. And that's partially why he doesn't get as much on this as he'd like to here. I think you're right. Cause he has CD lamb it's a and tight you have window, to... though. it's a freaking yeah. tight window to even try. And I don't know if he were to loft it. I think one of those safeties might've had a break on the right. football at that point, but I'm just saying like the leverage was there for CD lamb. But despite that, it, it was still like a very difficult throw. Like I don't necessarily fault Dak for this, but he's just trying to make something happen on a third and 15 and the giants benefit from, from a solid play from Darnay Holmes. I'll say. And flip it back to the sideline view. I just want to point out one funny thing I thought on the play. Watch, um, you'll see that probably, I think it's the top left of your screen after the interception. Yeah, the top left. Watch Dexter Lawrence setting up the block for the return. I freaking loved it. He's just like, you could tell this dude was like ready for this moment. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to be making block. Look at the turn <laughs> and just <laughs> locates. Yeah. And just now he's just like, I want it on this. He's like, it's my turn to do what you've yeah, been attempting exactly. to do to me all game. Yeah, <laughs> I love Dexter Lawrence. He was ready for it. That's awesome. Okay, that takes us to halftime here. Giants up 13-7 at half. It's going well so far. I mean, a lot of it's been interceptions, been stops, but at this point, you know, the you'll see in the second half is when the Cowboys offense really gets going through the pass game, but it starts right here. And this has been a problem for the Giants. They've given it they gave up a touchdown the first, right after halftime against the Lions. They give up a touchdown right after halftime here against the Cowboys. It's a 14 play 75 yard drive. It starts off with a good play by the Giants defense. It's a four yard, uh, a one yard run, but ultimately the the drive goes goes the wrong way. Yeah, the drive ends up going south, but I think the Giants started well on this first play. I mean, they get Dallas into a third and four situation, which we'll go over here in a couple plays. And right here, Giants are just filling their gaps. They're playing sound run defense. Jalen Smith is quick to fill that a gap to remove that as an option, and then watch just how tight and restricted the line of scrimmages. There's no space to run when Ezekiel Elliott basically gets the football. Everybody just, just up on the line, and then the pursuit defender who's unblocked from the backside, Nick McLeod, just makes the tackle, and it only ends up being a one-yard game. Sets up a second-and-nine situation. This is a tough one for the Giants because it extends the drive, and they have a really good loop here with, Ka with Kayvon Thibodeau. Comes around, gets to Dak Prescott, but Prescott does a really good job spinning out of this and turning this into a five-yard gain. If he can make this tackle here, Kayvon Thibodeau, and sack Prescott, we're looking at a third and long. Now, I guess against the Giants in this game, third and longs weren't guaranteed wins for the defense, but it would have given them a much better chance. Absolutely. And I like this pass rush too, because Kayvon Thibodeau runs through the inside shoulder of the tackle. And then the Giants bring Michael McFadden and Jason Pinnock right outside, <clears throat> excuse me, of the tackle. So you have two free rushers basically schemed against Ezekiel Elliott in protection with Kayvon Thibodeau going through two blockers. And the guard ends up getting distracted by Micah McFadden and comes off to locate him in the tackle. Smith passes Thibodeau to the guards. This is why Thibodeau just gets a free rush in at Dak Prescott, but he just misses. That's an excellent athletic play from Prescott to uh, to remove himself from getting absolutely obliterated by Thibodeau. Yep. Third and four situation we saw in the first game against the Giants earlier on Monday Night Football. The Cowboys had a big run out of a third and short situation. This is another example here. It's a 16-yard run from Ezekiel Elliott to convert on this third down. Yeah, this is annoying. Dak Prescott throws basically two blocks that really helped this play. If this was Daniel Jones who threw it, man, we would be talking about it a lot. So I think we should applaud Dak Prescott for throwing that block right there on Julian Love. Because Julian Love might contain him because this is just a zone run. Ezekiel Elliott feels the cutback and feels the flow of Jalen Smith removing himself, playing this really aggressively. But you've still got that contained defender of Julian Love there. But Julian Love ends up getting just chipped ever so slightly by Dak Prescott. And Ezekiel Elliott takes this third and four for what, 16 yards or something. 
Yeah, and this is a play where I wonder if it was Barkley or like at least early season Barkley, if it could have gone for a touchdown because he only had to beat Pinnock. Um, you know, at this stage, Zeke just doesn't have much explosion at all. So it wasn't doable there. But sets up here a little 13 yard run for for Tony Pollard here. It's another example of a Shane Zimmons not doing a good job hold, you know, setting the edge here. Like why why not? Why is he not containing this and forcing this back inside? He's doing a good job keeping everything narrow and not getting kicked out, but nobody's there to contain. I'm not sure if Jalen Smith was supposed to replace. I mean, it doesn't look like it. He's outside the hash. So you're supposed to keep that outside arm free if you're O'Shane's a menace to prevent this exact situation. But nobody at all contains Tony Pollard on this shotgun run. And you also have these other defenders just getting dominated by the Dallas wide receivers like Darnay Holmes is out there. So is Nick McLeod. It's a three by one set court off, but they're all engaged in blocks and they allow Tony Pollard to scamper for 13 yards. And Jalen Smith ends up making the tackle down the field. Exactly right. And that's just a big play by, by the John, um, by the Cowboys that to, to really set the tone on this drive. Next play first and 10. It's a three yard run. Three yard run by Tony Pollard. Another great play by Dexter Lawrence. To yeah, he's double teamed and- on this one too. Yeah, he's double teamed somehow. He just uh, he splits the. Uh, that's just silly. He splits the double team, but watch what he does to Tyler Biotis. He gets his hands inside quickly, but he f- sees Tony Pollard coming right through the a gap. So he just basically takes Tyler Biotis with him to the tackle point. <laughs> watch how he just drags Tyler Biotis to the ground and then makes contact on Tony Pollard to prevent this from going for a long gain. This only ends up being three yards. Sets up a second and seven. Another cover zero look from the Giants. They're staying aggressive. It worked for them in the first half. You'll see soon enough it doesn't work out well in the second half. But this play was not an example of that. This was a play with just really good coverage from uh, from Rodarius Williams here. Yeah, Rodarius Williams, it's not necessarily cover zero. It, it The safety is, it, is in the middle of the field, but he kind of comes down. But I'm wondering if there was anybody to threaten the, the seams or anything, if he would have matched them, I would imagine he would have. So there is, is a safety there, but uh, you have one-on-one one matchups. matchups. Yeah, you have one-on-one matchups outside, and Dak Prescott and the Cowboys keep a lot of people in protection because the Giants send the house. Micah McFadden almost gets home, and then there's a little bit of contact with Rodarius Williams and C.D. Lamb, but Rodarius Williams ends up staying on top of C.D. Lamb and then fluidly turning his hips at that moment. That's what really impressed me because C.D. Lamb, he's trying to do that whole thing where he sinks, decelerates, and then uses his hands to push the cornerback off ever so slightly that never gets called because the NFL, they hardly call these OPIs. But Darius Williams just doesn't allow him to do that. He stays right on the hip the entire time. Like That's smooth right there. That transition is very smooth. Get your eyes back on the quarterback. There's a throw play through the catch point. The throw is outside. C.D. Lamb does not get there. I feel like this is a pretty good rep right here from Darius Williams. You're right about that. Okay, so it sets up a third and seven situation here. This is one where you'll see a really good rep from Kayvon Thibodeau, but the Giants ultimately get called for a hold on Julian Love, one that Nick and I would probably both disagree with. Darnay Holmes, yeah. Oh, Darnay Holmes, not Julian Love, sorry. Of course, Holmes. Yeah, it's. can you see it right here? Is that the hold? Like it's it's a pretty phantom hold. It's something that I, I just don't understand how the ref threw it, but I love this pass rushing rep from Kayvon Thibodeau. I call this the Aziz Ojolari because this is Aziz Ojolari's patent and move right there. And he ends up getting that hit on Dak Prescott to force the overthrow. But we've seen Aziz Ojolari do this so many times, right? You stutter your feet, kind of swivel your hips, and then you go for that inside arm club, dip, rip, turn. And that's exactly what KT does here. I think this is my favorite rep for him. He doesn't even really make too much contact with Tyler Smith's hands. Tyler Smith Kind of goes high, but you can see he makes a little bit of contact there. But watch how low he gets. And then he just puts that inside shoulder right into the chest and then slides it over to the armpit and then just lifts up to effectively land the rip move and then turn and bend through contact. And I do think there's also a little bit of a hold here. Like, see, right at this moment, I think yeah. there's a little yeah. bit of a hold because I don't think Cave on Thibodeau's momentum is just going to stop like it does there and then just re go like it right. did. I think. I think there's just a little bit of a hold at that at that time. And then Kayvon Thibodeau ended up getting dinged up on this play, but he came back in the game. That's a very impressive individual rep from Kayvon Thibodeau. And we'll see from the sideline angle the egregious hold by Darnay Holmes on the number two up at the top of the screen. Nothing impedes C.D. Lamb at that, at that point. Right. And the throw wasn't even catchable. It was, I don't know, it's frustrating. It's a frustrating, definitely a frustrating call. It extends the drive here. I mean, if you don't have that call, this turns into what a field goal drive and you could still have a game 
The Giants offense doesn't really ultimately do much more until the garbage time, but still, still a different game. Anyway, we get back into this drive after the hold extends it. Four yard run for Zeke Elliott. They come out with a heavy tight team personnel. Uh, I thought Zeke did a good job here of processing the cutback lane to even create four from this. Cause like you see a lot of running backs take the handoff, run toward that mucked up area and just run right to the back. Like, you know, in the back of an offensive lineman, he does a good job processing. Okay. There is actually something I can do here to create some kind of positive gain. And it's a nice run. Turn yeah. Four. Yeah. It's a very nice run. And he also knows he has three tight ends and a wide receiver right. on that, on that cutback side. And Mondo is on that side and Mondo gets absolutely just removed by the double team with the tight end. And look at, Look at your guy, Ferguson, remove Mondo and then pick up Micah McFadden to allow that hole to open up. And it looks like Zeke kind of steps on the foot of CD lamp or Noah Brown. And that's one reason why he wasn't able to kind of get vertical. Yeah. Even though uh, Smith would have made the play, but still it could have been even more. Yeah. Good block by Ferguson there as well. Second and six Cowboys come back to counter here and are able to pick up the first down with a six yard run. Yeah, I believe this is another pretty negative play for Mondo. We were talking him up a little bit earlier. I felt like he had some good plays, but he gets removed here from the tight front by a tight end. Again, he engages. This is He doesn't anchor down well when he's engaged with a tackle, and then a tight end hits his hip. We've seen Leonard Williams, and obviously Leonard Williams is a different type of player. But we've seen them anchor right. down in these types of situations, but Mondo gets removed. I feel like Jalen Smith just does a very good job being instinctual, reading the counter run, and then filling and then delivering a huge hit at that moment knock someone's towel off of them. I think his own towel comes flying off of him to keep that rushing lean kind of narrow. Michael McFadden can't get over because this tight end who removed Mondo does such a good job to pick. That's such a good play by this tight end right here. Is that, I don't think that's Jake Ferguson. Is it? I think that's a, uh, no, it's I think not that's Ferguson. Pendershot. It's Pendershot. Peyton, yep. Yeah. Peyton Hendershot who does this. And then he, that's such a good play because he just removed two players yeah. and this forces the alley defender to make the play Julian love. And he ends up making it, but still man, what good blocking over to the play side of a counter run here really is. That's a first down for the Cowboys. They come back to the run. The giants are ready for it. Hold them to a one yard loss here. Leonard Williams making a great backside tackle here. Yeah, this is one of the better plays by Mondo. So he has two negative plays in a row consecutive. And now he shoots his hands inside of Steele, pushes Steele into the backfield. And that forces a cutback lane. And as Tony Pollard goes to cut, Leonard Williams makes the tackle in backside pursuit because that's what Leonard Williams does. Yes, sir. Now second and 11 here. Giants, once again, do a really good job of stopping them here on a second and 11 to set up a third and long. It's another negative play for the offense. They finally string a couple together. Dak doesn't have anything, checks down to the flat, and it's a good job by the Giants events to rally to him and uh, make the stop. I believe that's Micah McFadden. Yeah, Micah McFadden makes a really good play here to, to just see where Tony Pollard is releasing, and then he closes with and breaks down very quickly. Watch, no wasted movement at this point once he realizes what's happening. And then he just makes the tackle right as Tony Pollard is making this catch. And if you look at the coverage downfield, there's not much going on. You have some pressure from, I believe that's Leonard Williams at the feet of Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott ends up ends up taking a tumble. Because I'm wondering if, he, if Dak Prescott can hit this wheel route to number 89, the tight end. It looks like it's covered up well by Nick McLeod. But that's the size advantage that is exploited a little bit later on in the game with Dalton Schultz. But he elects to check it down to Pollard and just a great play by Michael McFadden on the sideline. So now third and 12. I mean, this is the spot you want to be in as a defense. you you got to be able to the Giants have to start getting off the field in these situations here. Instead, they come again with with a lot of pressure. It's a six man pressure if I'm counting this right. So that's a lot of guys. But, you know, it's a tough I guess it's just like a tough, tough job right here is that homes and coverage against cd lamb it's a tough mm -hmm. spot but i'm wondering like on this play nick you're sending six pass rushers right is that totally necessary is it better off to maybe use because you have to use i believe it's dane belt in there 24 to contain like he has to obviously he can't get in the passing lane because he has to respect the tight end leaking out and that's his assignment yep. but maybe if you have one more guy in coverage you can get into the passing lane and take away CD lamb and make them win those with those outside receivers on an, on a different kind of route. You have a better chance as a defense here. I think you would. And there is a deep safety at the, at the moment. I also like this pass rush because this is something that they're experimenting with the giants. Kayvon Thibodeau is the middle linebacker. So Kayvon Thibodeau is over the center about three yards off the line of scrimmage. And the giants basically just take the two four eye 
one of them is a three technique I, or the two, three techniques, I guess you're saying they slant him inside and they try to get the entire Dallas offensive line basically on top of each other with Oshin Zimenez and Kayvon Thibodeau looping around while also bringing Jason Pinnock on the blitz to occupy Tony Pollard. It's blocked up really well by Dallas, but this is a creative pass rush, although it is a little bit long developing and the pressure never really gets there. I'm right. kind of, ho- I'm kind of wishing I like the fact that they're dictating like this and they're they're really diving into their bag of tricks, but you're right. I think you have to give Darnay Holmes a little bit of help over the middle of the field. You have a deep safety. Could he have done that? Could he have sunk underneath any sort of in-breaking route of CeeDee Lamb? Possibly, but the Giants are also worried about getting beat deep over the top. Right. So it's a crappy situation overall. But I, at this point in the game, CeeDee Lamb, he's starting to feast. And I think you, you have to you have to find a way to stop him when you know Dak Prescott's eyes are directly going to go there in every one of these third and long type of situations. And the Cowboys try to run off of this first and 15 after a false start, a similar play to the outside they ran earlier with Pollard. I think got like 12 yards this time. Uh, Giants are ready for it. Dexter Lawrence makes a nice play. And Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams just rally to make this tackle to set up a second and 15. And Dallas is just so undisciplined at this point of the game, right? Because they're going to complete this little five yard pass to Dalton Schultz, but then they're going to take another false start right. penalty. And they find themselves in a third and 15, Dan, after just converting a third and 12. So, like us sitting on our couch eating our turkey, we're like, ah, oh, well, the Giants will get out of this one, hopefully, right? Like, I know their secondary kind of sucks, but it's a condensed field. It's a third and 15. Yeah, just you look know? at how it looks before the snap. Pause it there. Like, just roll it back a little bit if you can. I don't know. This is still the Schultz play. This Sorry. is still the third. This is the, still yeah, yeah. The, the third and 15, but it's just a little quick to Schultz. Second and even 15, at this yeah. point, it's a, yeah, it's a second and 15. And now we'll go to the third and 15 after a false start. This alignment is pre-snap. Like the Giants end up ultimately rushing for getting pressure with four with a twist game up front. And despite all that, they give up a touchdown. You think, and you look at it and you're like, how is that possible? Well, just look at where Dak Prescott is when he just look at where Schultz is when Dak Prescott releases his football. I mean, come on. You want to talk about an anticipatory throw? This is the definition of anticipatory throw with pressure in his face, about to get hit by the looper. And it doesn't even matter because he throws the ball before Schultz gets out of his break and throws it with pinpoint perfect accuracy away from his frame, outside of his frame. This is an impossible play to defend in my mind. I don't care that it's Nick McLeod here. Like maybe if it's some like long, great defender, he might be able to get his hand on it. I don't know, but I don't, I'm not even sure of that. And just to make this throw before, like I have not, I just haven't seen too many of these throws watching tape of of the giants or who the giants have played with this kind of anticipation. What I'm a little befuddled about is what Julian Love is doing on this play. So the Giants have the two safeties deep. They're off leverage on Dalton Schultz. They're off leverage on Michael Gallup. And watch, it's a three-by-one set with, well, it's actually a three-by-two set because Cowboys are in empty, but Tony Pollard and Dalton Schultz are to that boundary side. CeeDee Lamb is the number three receiver to the field side. And watch how the Giants play CeeDee Lamb. Darnay Holmes takes inside, and then you have three guys on CeeDee Lamb. So we're talking about paying attention to CeeDee Lamb. Look what they Uh do here. CeeDee Lamb, He's got his outside route is going to be removed by Darnay Holmes. And then his deep route, because this is a third and goal at the 15 yard line, his deep route is his deep route to the outside is going to be covered by Dane Belton. If it is a deep seven or a corner route, anything like that, which it is. And then you have Julian Love, who is going to remove any inside breaking route because Darnay Holmes has outside leverage on CD Lamb. So that's three guys right there. So everybody else has to win their matchup. So I guess I'm not confused. Maybe I shouldn't have used that word by. I'm- by Julian Love, but that's a lot. That is a lot of sources to allocate towards CD Lamb. But hey, that's what we called for in a lot of other situations. No, but I'm confused too because take a look, rewind it back a little bit, just a, t- a tad bit, and stop it like right here. Dax already opened up to his left right here. Like Dax fully open to his left. Why is Lynn? Look at where the where the D back in that second half is, is starting to take a step to. Why Dax opened up to his left here and then he throws the ball to his left. It almost looks like. The D back is not like is not even watching his eyes at all. He's watching the receivers. Yeah, he's paying attention. You talking about Julian Love? Yeah. Yeah, he's paying attention to the release of the number three. And if the release of the number three comes over the middle of the field, he's going to break on that. CD Lamb's that got to hide the guy, as we mentioned a couple plays ago. But that leaves Nick McLeod in a one on one against Dalton Schultz. And there's a significant size and even experience. Uh, disadvantage for Nick McLeod in this situation. That's a good route by Schultz, too, because he releases outside of Pinnock to create the pick for Tony Pollard. And you can see how Pinnock has to work through that traffic, but 
Dak Prescott wants a touchdown. He doesn't want like a little check down and have Tony Pollard outrun a sa- two safeties to the to the pylon. So he just sees the one on one matchup, sees that Julian Love goes over to the other side of the field and then takes the shot. Another quick processing and just an amazing anticipatory throw by Dak Prescott. We can see it from the end zone angle too. Giants don't total, really get much. Total backbreaker here. Total backbreaker. And, and Jihad Ward actually gets a quarterback hit. They That's don't send a lot of four yeah, press, four man pressure. They get there. And it's just thrown before the receivers, even out of his break. Then it's high away from his frame and outside. It's just like, that's, that's, I don't think the Giants did anything wrong on this with the exception of maybe like the safety play. This is just a really good throw and a really good play from Dak, unfortunately. Honestly, man, I'm wondering if Dak at this moment, he's catching the football and the snap just happened. He looks directly at Darnay Holmes. And I'm wondering if he diagnoses that Darnay Holmes is in outside shade because Darnay Holmes, obviously, you can even see it on the screen right here. He's outside. So he knows that Julian Love is going to have the inside breaking route. And that confirms to him that he's going to have the one-on-one matchup. Because right when he confirms this post-snap, as you see, he comes right to Dalton Schultz and fires that football. I think that's what yeah, happened, it's man. Quick. It's quick. You're right. That is quick. He processes that really quick and flips flips his hips left and makes that throw. Yep. He looks to see what Pinnock is doing as well. Yeah, see how he checks all Fast processing. Bro, it's so fast. He's... Confirm the outside leverage. Okay, Julian Love's going to have the inside break. Dane Belton's going to have the outside break. Basically, triple team bracket coverage on CD Lamb. Transition to see what's happening with Jason Pinnock, Dalton Schultz. Does Tony Pollard have leverage on that? Don't like the leverage there. That means I have a one on one matchup with Nick McLeod. Let's fire the football. Touchdown. Crazy. Yep. Great play by Dak, unfortunately, for the Giants here. Sets up another, the next drive. So this, this is like where it starts to, you know, tumble down for the Giants right after halftime again, just like against the Lions. Because their next drive is after the Giants, I believe, turn it over on downs. And so it's only a 44-yard field they have to go. But they go six plays, 44 yards, and score a touchdown. Yeah, Dan, sudden change. After the Giants turn the football over on down, take a shot. We absolutely love that about coordinators, just aggressive coordinating in general. And that's what Kellen Moore does here. This is a great play by by um, Rodarius Williams against Michael Gallup. Just stays right in his hip, reduces, restricts, restricts, restricts. And then once he contacts him, he gets his head around and then gets that hand where it needs to be and knocks the football away. Good play by a young player in a really tough one-on-one situation. And we'll see the Giants do have a safety deep, but they still bring the pressure. And Dak Prescott looks like he looks that safety off to really isolate Rodarius Williams in that one-on-one matchup. Yeah, exactly. This is another, this is a pretty, what'd you say? This is another just great play by Kayvon Thibodeau too. I'm sorry there, but watch how Kayvon Thibodeau runs through the tight end. Cause like I said, man, they're really starting to pay attention to Kayvon Thibodeau. He's the Sam right here on the line of scrimmage, but he has to run through two blockers, which allows Nick McLeod to be a free rusher in on Dak Prescott. And then he occupies Ezekiel Elliott. So essentially he's dealing with three guys in protection just by himself. And a free rusher comes in on Prescott. Prescott gets the football away, but still that's like a low key play. No one's going to talk about off Kayvon Thibodeau, but it's a putting Ezekiel Elliott on his ass. Good point. And it forces the throw to come a little bit early from Dak and still look how much Dak gets on that throw. It's a little inside. If Dak puts that outside, it might be a touchdown, but enough inside for Darius Williams, like you said, to do a great, it's a great rep from Williams because he gets his head around and put and positions himself to where he can put his hand in the throwing lane. And that's the tip right there. If he doesn't get his hand in that spot, it's probably a touchdown. Exactly. Exactly. So you love to see young players like that. I mean, this is an opportunity of a lifetime for Rodarius Williams, and I'm sure he's probably earned snaps. Like if you were to ask me, who do you want to play out of these current cornerbacks? I think Rodarius Williams is one of the first names that come to my mind, him or Nick McLeod, which is yeah sad, sad at this point. But yes, like I think Rodarius Williams has earned snaps after his performance against Dallas. For sure. Second and 10 situation, you know, Dak fumbles the ball out of the snap and it's just, you just, they still get a positive play out of this. This is just when I kind of felt like, all right, we're in trouble here because this, usually, you know, on these fumble plays, it can lead to a negative play, a great play for the defense. Instead, he just picks it up and just gets rid of the football and takes what the defense gives him. And it's a five yard gain. It's stupid. I hate it, dude. So many times, like you said, they just fall on top of it. He's able to just pick it up, dust it off and just still find Ferguson open and like, <laughs> There's so many things that had to go right for the Cowboys here after so many things went wrong. And look how he gets his eyes up and knows that he's open. Pinnock has, is that too much of a depth? Kayvon Thibodeau almost gets a sack on the play too, just by slanting right inside and then just using his outside arm to basically rip through the inside arm of Smith and just absolutely positions himself optimally against Smith. Look how poor of a position Smith is in to execute this block if they're stepping out. Ends up getting the quarterback hit. 
Third and five, Cowboys create the first down with a run play here. That's not what you want to see, but it's a well-timed call by the Cowboys and good patience and processing from Zeke. Yeah, and just counter run out of shotgun with the backside tackle pulling. And Zeke, look, it looks bottled up at this point. Jalen Smith is positioned in that B gap with the kick out, or it should be like a C gap with the kick out. But then he just cuts right back into the B gap and no one's there except for Nick McLeod in pursuit. Ends up picking up enough yardage to set up a, uh, a a nice play for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Yep, first and 10 here. Good example of Dak's arm talent on display on this first and 10. Good example of good coverage from the Giants, but just an incredible play by the quarterback in my mind. People will talk about the one-handed catch, but this is a quarterback play. He has to bail to his left. He's rolling to his left and still gets that much on the throw. It's high outside and away from the frame toward the sideline outside the numbers. That is a really difficult throw to make for a right-handed quarterback rolling to his left, flip his hips around and deliver that football. If he throws that anywhere inside, which most quarterbacks do in this spot, almost all the quarterbacks I've seen on film this year have, it's incomplete, might be intercepted. I don't know, but here he's able to just put this high outside away from the frame until the only spot you can throw it for this to be a possible catch and look at Lamb, I mean, it's a one-handed grab, but it hits him right in the one hand. It's it's a phenomenal pitch and catch from the Dallas Cowboys. Again, I'm use that word too much throughout this podcast, but you're right. I mean, he's throwing away from his body on the run, has to turn his hips, flip it, and then fade away to throw this. Hits Lamb right where it needs to be, and Lamb with the concentration to pin it to his helmet, David Tyree light, obviously not to the importance. And then now the Dallas Cowboys get a first down, first and goal after a Nice play that was actually a flag, too, on Darnay Holmes that they declined. Yep. And so here, they throw out to the flat to Zeke. Nice tackle from Jalen Smith in space. Sets up second and goal here. And this PA is boot. Be a touchdown. touchdown to Schultz. Too easy. Too easy at this point. And it looks like Pinnock might fall for that little inside stem by Dalton Schultz. And that just created the leverage he needed to win outside the numbers. If you look, yep. it's off the play action boot. Schultz acts like he's going to block. Now nah, screw you. I'm going to roll right towards Dak Prescott, make the catch, score the tutty. And it's at this point, Dan, where all seems lost. <laughs> yeah. But, but there is another eight play, or sorry, a 10 play, 80 yard drive for a touchdown by the Cowboys just to really ice this thing. And that's when we really entered true garbage time after that. Um, and so we'll go over some of the plays from that. It starts with a jet sweep. The Giants play well for a one-yard loss. Yeah, this is a similar play that they ran the first play of the game. This time, it's Leonard Williams just expanding it. No Shane Zemena is doing a much better job expanding it, kind of reading what right. exactly is going on here. So it's well played by the Giants, but a little bit a little bit late. And then Justin Ellis gets little that too, little too late. Game. That's how no Shane should have played the other two that we already highlighted, you know? Yeah. Here's another hold on Kayvon Thibodeau on this second and 11 play. Yeah, it wasn't called. Another good pass rush by Thibodeau. And this is just, look at this throw, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's getting destroyed here, <laughs> Dak. <laughs> he doesn't have anywhere to even ground himself before this throw. And somehow gets the football outside the hat, like outside the nut hash or outside the numbers, at least not outside the hash to the outside shoulder of a receiver. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's a beautiful throw by Dak Prescott on a second and 11 to pick up 15 yards to C.D. Lamb. It should Giants. have been a win for the Giants defense. It really should have been. And the Giants blitz Jalen Smith. Tony Pollard picks him up off the play action. And Kayvon Thibodeau wins high side. That should have been called a hold look again. Yes. Kayvon Thibodeau is in such a better position than Tyler Smith. And Tyler Smith has his whole wrist basically choking Kayvon Thibodeau. I don't know what this guy has to do to get a holding what call. What is that dude? Do? What are these two refs doing behind him? I just don't understand what they're looking at. Cause I know you're not allowed to use your outs, your outside arm to put it around someone's like neck, which no, is what we've not. seen now multiple times. Neither three times, called. three times. Yeah. I just don't three times the same exact rep where he's just like beat by the defensive end by cave And so all he can really do is hook him with that left arm. <laughs> it's just like, maybe but, Kayvon needs to plead more to the refs or something. I don't know what's, what's happening, but it's been very consistent throughout this whole season. It has. And, Dallas is the better football team and they deserve to win this football yeah. game. But these refs were freaking horrendous, like terrible. Throw. And you know, the, you know, Brian Dable didn't want to say as much as like, yeah, they have a tough job, but Brian Dable was fuming because of that uh, post game fuming because of that 
touchdown to Isaiah Hodgins that was called back. There were multiple missed calls like this, a lot of ticky tacky type of calls that went against the Giants, some stupid calls that went against Dallas as well. I just feel like Scott Novak's crew is horrendous and hopefully they're not doing any big time playoff games. Yeah, there's a lot of bad crews these days around the NFL, to be completely honest with you. I haven't seen many. I think do a good job to be <laughs> the ones who do the best, the ones who take themselves out of the game, um, in my mind. So we move on to a first and 10 here, 11 yard run for Tony Pollard. Yep, Tony Pollard gets this. This is, I think, Pollard's best run of the game, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, he us that well. Yep. It's just, uh, yeah, the Giants did a good job against Pollard. And you're bringing that backside H back over to the double Y set again to help kick out that end man, which they do on Tamon Fox. This is something that Dallas really did well against the Giants. Jalen Smith positions himself in a solid spot against Jake Ferguson and then ends up getting a hand on Pollard, but McLeod makes the tackle, tries to force the fumble. That does not work. Sets up a first and 10 play, and now they go back to the run. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the Cowboys are milking the clock here. They want to get this game over with from a time standpoint. There are multiple scores at this point, so it's a one-yard stop. Good stop by the Giants, but again, at this stage of the game, it's not worth too much. Yes, I agree, but I did want to highlight this play because of Micah McFadden, who is that weak side linebacker. This is a weak side run off the backside of a triple Y set, so you can just see it's just beef, beef, beef. That's Dallas's MO right now on offense. So they try running weak side and watch Michael McFadden get low through the contact of an offensive guard who had a clean climb up to him, set to the outside, and then get low to make that tackle as he's kind of going down because of the pressure from the from the guard. But he look how low he is right here. Engage sets his base, winning that pad level, keeps that outside arm free, makes the tackle despite the fact that he's engaged with somebody much bigger than him. Good tackle, good play. Second and nine. We'll see another play action slide underneath and just wide open Ferguson. This is the one what you were referencing earlier where Ferguson shows off his athleticism, catches the yeah. football here and just sees Pinnock coming down. Pinnock tries to make a play low. He hurdles him, stays on his feet, and then yeah, attacks right into the body of the second Giants defender. This was a really nice play by Ferguson. But I just To be that wide open, there's obviously some kind of breakdown. He made this look easy though. Like he doesn't even lose stride or lose his balance. Watch whoop, like a gazelle. Like <laughs> that's an insanely athletic play from Jake Ferguson. And I think one of these linebackers loses their responsibility. Maybe Jalen Smith, maybe Micah McFadden. I'm thinking Micah McFadden is taking the slide player, but Jihad Ward realizes what's going on. So he just makes contact on him. Like, oh wow, he tried to block me, but nobody accounts for <laughs> your guy, Jake Ferguson. Might've been Smith. Could have been McFadden. I mean, does it matter at this point? <laughs> These linebackers and their mistakes. Yeah, it's just too too often we see it on film, unfortunately, which will set up a first and 10 situation down the field for the Cowboys after that one. They're now challenging and scoring distance. I believe this was another penalty they called, or did they call a penalty? Oh, no, this was the this was the Kayvon Thibodeau play that you were referencing earlier, so you can break this one down. Yeah, Kayvon Thibodeau, again, you, massive beef, 13 personnel. There is not a triple tight end to one side type of set. You have Dalton Schultz to the weak side, which is where Kayvon Thibodeau is, and then C.D. Lamb is aligned behind the tight ends on the other side. But C.D. Lamb, I mean, but Dalton Schultz gets blown up by Kayvon Thibodeau. Kayvon Thibodeau just sees the path of Dak Prescott and just runs right through Dalton Schultz, backing him right into Ezekiel Elliott, which ends up being a so loss. Much power. So much power, and I get it. It's a tight end. This is this my is a, favorite play I've seen on film, I think, from any Giants defender, including some bass rushes, dude. I just think it's so impressive to be able to drive any player, tight end, tackle, whatever it is, full back, whatever this would be, even a receiver, that quick off where he was on the line of scrimmage right into the running back. Like It's just so insanely impressive from an athletic standpoint. It is, and one reason why, and I'm not poo-pooing it, but one reason yeah. why is because watch Dalton Schultz. Watch how slow he is to realize the ball is snapped. He just has a really bad get off. The ball is snapped here. Dalton Schultz still in his stance. Now True. he starts to come out of his stance and everybody's already reacted. And he's just so slow with his hands. And it also is came on so quick with his hands to engage his power and just use his lower body strength to run through Schultz. And look how pissed off Schultz is right here. And look at Kayvon Thibodeau. He's like, what the heck? Schultz like rolls on top of him, takes Kayvon Thibodeau's helmet, kind of pins it into the ground. Oh yeah. And just puts his knee into his side a little bit. And then, Goes to get up, and uses fly. uses Kayvon Thibodeau's face mask to get up. <laughs> and Kayvon Thibodeau puts his hand in the air, like, "Yeah, what the hell, man?" Yeah, that was funny. That was a, that was a little bit of a dirty play there by Dalton Schultz. So I'm sure he's just pissed about losing that rep. He lost it badly too. Yeah. 
So second and 23 after a penalty on holding call. Uh, that's what I was referencing a bit earlier. It's a 12 yard run here to set up a third and 11. And this is another one of those frustrating. I know the game's over and watch the Mick Foley right here from, from Jalen Smith to jump on top of the pile when the, when the play is over <laughs> the people <laughs> elbow, <laughs> how many WWE references can I make? Get, he didn't get called for that. Yeah, no, it was definitely unwarranted and just kind of silly looking, but this is one of those plays, man, where it's like the game is out of reach. It, it, it's pretty, it's, it's <laughs> a not, a, we're not motivated at this point. Like the Giants are going to come back and win this football game, but no. now you're in a third and 11 situation. You still want to get off the field in a third and 11. Exactly. exactly. Dallas still converts. Over the middle of the field to CD Lamb. Just like the same thing earlier. we converted earlier. It's like the same exact little inbreaker where there's just so much. Look at the leverage he has. And then, I mean, this is this is not good tape for Darnay Holmes in my mind. We'll watch it on the sideline angle, but this is a really good pass rushing rep from O'Shane against Terrence Steele. Watch how quick, and this is one of the things I love most about O'Shane Zimenez, is first off, he's pretty quick off the line of scrimmage, and he's very fast with his hands. And watch how he just breaks the contact of the outside arm with like a quick little double swipe, it looks like, and then just lands. the doesn't even really need to land the rip move because he's already past the hip-to-hip -hip relationship. Like he's already created the separation, so all he has to do is turn the corner, and he does that pretty well. And it's just, that's such an insane throw by Dak Prescott to get it off right before Ocean Zimenez contacts him. And also take a look at Kayvon Thibodeau. Just talk about attention being paid to you. Right. Two guys on his side. Let's check the sideline angle, though, Dan, to see what leverage Darnay Holmes is in. Darnay, oh, see, this is what they do. The, the Dallas Cowboys are in a stack to the field side, and Nick McLeod is in press on Noah Brown, who's up on the line of scrimmage. CeeDee Lamb's off the line of scrimmage, and Darnay Holmes is in slight outside leverage about, what, six yards off the line of scrimmage, seven yards off the line of scrimmage, and then the release outside from Brown takes McLeod that way. So now you have a two way go for CD lamb against Darnay Holmes with space. And he just accelerates right past him. And it's just a tough situation to be in, but that's just not a situation that like, I want to trust Darnay Holmes in at all. But unfortunately it's what happened. Yep. Sets up a first and goal here for the Cowboys. Um, they punch it in eventually with a touchdown to Pender shot. Yeah. Pender shot. This is the crazy play, though, to C.D. Lamb, where he catches it off the fake. See that yeah. little deception? Deception by C.D. Lamb to go like he's going to fake block to the backside on a, on a jet fake jet sweep to Tony Pollard with a halfback pitch. Good play by Pinnock to put him in phase, but just an insane throwing catch, almost catch, I should say, to C.D. Lamb. He doesn't get his one foot down in bounds, and then here's the touchdown to Pender shot. It's just... Uh, Unfortunate situation when you have a tight end running a touchdown in on you. Michael McFadden kind of yeah. gets froze up there. And at this point, it's it's over. And we could see all the Dallas Cowboys run into the Salvation Army. Good. They, they cut it off. I didn't really want to watch it, even though I yeah. enjoy, <laughs> enjoy putting myself through pain, apparently, because I was going to let it run. Yeah. I don't think we, if you, we could, as we go over the superlatives now, we can run the last. They have one more drive, six plays, 35 yards, and they, they I think they miss a field goal at the end of it. Um, the game well, well over by that point. Uh, for, for the New York Giants, unfortunately. So let's transition into our superlatives for this game, Nick. And let's start with the unheralded player on film for you. Easy. I think it's Rodarius Williams. I feel like the kid, after tearing his ACL last year, coming back, being forced into essentially a starting type of role, played really well against a tough opponent. And it wasn't just the interception. I feel like there was other reps that he excelled at. So I'm going to go with Rodarius. It's Rodarius for me too. I, I I like when we have different ones, but it's not going to always happen. To me, it was the, the pass breakup on that on that vert ball that that Dak put a pretty good pretty good put in a pretty good spot. I mean, that was excellent coverage. It's a tough assignment down the field. He gets his head around. He puts his hand in position. Literally deflects the football. Otherwise, it drops right into the receiver's bread basket. So great play there. And in general, I just felt like he looked good in coverage for what I was expecting. So he'll win that. How about highest effort player on film for you? Highest effort player. I mean, it could be a lot of players. I mean, it could be Dexter Lawrence. I'm trying to think if there's, I mean, I don't want to be one for of those sure. people who, who double up, but I'm guessing I'm probably going to double up and yeah. just go with Avon Thibodeau. Yeah, it's Thibodeau for sure for me. And it's not even close. I thought Thibodeau. I try not to double up, him, but you could double up. if you, you should double up. You should just go by what's right. Like do what you think is right. Don't worry about the double ups. Okay. Yeah, because we're yeah, also going to then transition to best player on film, and that is Kayvon Thibodeau for me. How about you? 
Yeah, of course. Kayvon Thibodeau. Yes. He got an incredible game. It's living up to the fifth overall selection type of game. Agreed entirely. And this was the first game he won best player of the week on film for us, by the way, just as a little, I, I still haven't done the to totals yet. I'll do that. I, I'm going to have some time on a flight coming up. So I'm going to do a bunch of different work stuff in that, in that five hours. Cause unfortunately I'm going away this weekend, Nick, I, um, to, to, uh, the West, uh, by, out by you actually. Oh, where are you going, man? I'm going to Arizona, buddy. I'm visiting Nick this weekend for those listening. So you guys are going to get a podcast from us in the same area, but it's a long flight. And by the way, Nick, they screw nowadays. Okay, I'm not going to trash United on this flight because I know you know someone who, <laughs> who works for United, but I have my issues with United, and that's the one I fly all the time out of Newark. And I just, when I looked up this flight, dude, the only seat I could get that wasn't a middle seat would be an extra charge. I just like, you got to put some of the aisles or the windows up for free. Like, you can't be doing this thing. I looked like three, two and a half months ago, and I all the best I could get was a middle seat. So I'm stuck in a middle seat for this flight. I am just praying. That ah, this is gonna. I hope this doesn't come off sounding bad, but I'll just be honest. I'm praying for two skinny people to sit next to me. I'm just gonna say it straight oh, no, up. I don't, dude, I don't think that's a, a bad take. Everyone wants that. It's not you know? nice. It, it's not nice, but it is it, what it is, man. It might not be nice, space. but it, those seats are brutal, man. Like they're they, very, they very are, narrow. They, they give you. Nothing. We're not tall. We're not tall guys, but yeah. like I do feel like. Even I'm like condensed in there. I'm like, dude, yeah. if I was like six foot four, I don't know how they fly. I'd have to pay for first class if I was six foot. <laughs> I literally have to play for first class if I was six foot four. Sorry. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're really excited to host. Yeah. We're really yeah, excited. We're going to have a host. good time out there. We'll break down some film from Nick's spot too. And we'll do some, some of the stuff we normally do out there. But I will say this on that flight, I'm going to try to tally up all of our award winners. So I want to have like a good thing I can post. Twitter and let the fans know like, where we're at tally wise. And we'll, and I'll obviously have time to do more film and stuff. It's a five hour flight. So we'll see what happens there, but let's get back into these superlatives and let's go with your favorite defensive play call of this game by wink. So I, I don't know if it's my favorite cause they didn't work out, but I like the creativity mm -hmm. of having cave on Thibodeau. They did it twice this game as the mic and Mike. then just use, yeah. Using the four eyes to, to, basically force the guard in the center on top of each other. So they're just going to slant inside towards like the a gap. And then you have the other outer guys also slant inside, but one of them, O'Shane Zimenez loops all the way from the other side. And then KT loops all the way from the other side. You have two loopers. And then if you're that running back in pass protection with five guys or six guys coming, or it might even be a five man rush. You have to commit to one of those players, and it just kind of forces a, a chaotic mess along the offensive line. So I think that might be my my favorite design, even though it, it's kind of slow developing. But I just like the creativity. I, I wouldn't call it too much though, because it is so slow developing. I think against quarterbacks like Davis Mills, it might have worked a little bit yeah. better, but against Dak Prescott, not so much. I'm gonna go with NA. I didn't. I got to be honest. I wasn't really a fan of Wink's Wink's game plan, and I didn't really think. I mean, look, there were a lot of third and longs that they just didn't get off the field on. That's really where I usually find my favorite play call. So that was a creative one. It was interesting. I'm just not as. I'm personally not as big a fan of those like long developing blitzes. I would rather if I was ever a coordinator, I wouldn't be like Patrick Graham, where I'm just sitting and rushing four all day unless I had the four you could do. But I would have more of just on the line of scrimmage blitzes or or like the nickel lined up on the line of scrimmage, like you saw them do earlier in the game. I mean, Dak read it and he read the hot through the land. Like we, we just broke it down, but those like long developing blitzes from depth from the second and third level. I just, I just never been a fan of those watching NFL game. I feel like they take too long and they only work against slow processing quarterbacks. Um, so also just releasing jelly from the one tech into the guard to create the two on one on, on Tyler Smith, like little plays like like that's not difficult. Right. But right. The path of the one technique there is going to dictate how many blockers, if they're in a five man protection, can help Tyler Smith. And if right. nobody, if there isn't a fifth blocker, if Tony Pollard releases into the route like he did, it's an easy two versus one. And Dak Prescott needs to get rid of the football very quick. And this is something that Kayvon Thibodeau talked about today in his in his press conference, just about how the Giants are forcing teams to get rid of the football in such a quick manner because they are dialing up blitzes like that and they're just adjusting the paths of certain players to engage a two versus one matchup that's what we love the most about wink martindale but Dak prescott's one of the most dangerous quarterbacks to go up against because he can get rid of the football so quickly and you need to be a sure tackling team too 
when, when you when you are running those. And I feel like the Giants are one of the most surest tackling teams in the NFL, even with these backups. There weren't like too many huge missed tackles True. in space. There was the Jason Pinnock one against um, Dalton Schultz that really comes to my mind. But other than that, I'm not really thinking of many just missed yeah. tackles in space. And that's difficult when you're in man coverage, man, because you're on an island. You miss a tackle. True. That dude is gone, especially when you're in cover zero. That's a really good observation. And one thing I'm thinking about when you talk about what Kayvon Thibodeau said in the press or what we just watched on tape, what we've watched all season is the value of having, if they can find one, a Fred Warner type linebacker in this defense, specifically the way they play schematically under Wink, like just as you broke down, having one of those, having two of those guys would change the entire defense. Even having just one guy like that at the second level would make such an impact on this defense. And I'm going to really be thinking about that when we turn our like when we turn the coverage over to the draft and potentially free agency, I doubt there'll be anything in free agency from that position. There's basically never is. But, Jermaine Edmonds. I mean, I know Joe Shane has a relationship yeah. with him. I don't I know how much money, agent, but he's going to ask for a lot. We'll see if they have that in the money to yeah. do that. It all just kind of, it's going to be really interesting free agency, which I'm actually excited about from our coverage standpoint, because I'm not sold that he's going to go Barkley and Jones or he, he could, he could sign Barkley and Jones. And then we're done with cap, and that's basically it because we still have to keep cap for Thomas and Love and Dexter. So that'll be just it. That's the core then of the Giants moving forward. And they'll be back in cap hell, by the way. If they resign Jones and Bar, they resign Barkley to a massive deal and give Jones like a two or three year deal at like 30 mil a year. And Lawrence and Thomas, those are market setting deals. Like Lawrence is going to get a market setting interior defensive lineman deal, Thomas is going to get a market setting left tackle deal. I'm pretty sure of both of those things. If all four of those things happen, they're right back in Capel pretty much. I mean, that's just the core. That's it. They have to draft well and hope that the uh, the idea that some fans have that, you know, if you do perfect around Jones, it can get good. So I'm not so sold he's going to go that route. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, Giants fans are like, you can't not do that because then you're going to have the team take a step back. But I don't know if Joe Shane is thinking of it like that, to be completely honest. He may be thinking about this three, four, five years down the line rather than just what's going to keep us go the momentum building for 2023. And that's going to piss off a lot of fans if he goes in that direction. But we'll see what happens because that's when you start to think about like, OK, can they sign a Tremaine Edmonds? Well, no, not if they do sign Barkley and Jones. That's it. They're not like they have too many other guys they need to resign from their own core. So we'll see. This is not the time to talk about this right now anyway, but it'll be very interesting to see what they did there. Let's wrap this thing up with a pass rush grade one through ten and then a run blocking run defense grade. Sorry. It's crazy. It's not like they got a, a ton of sacks or anything like that, right? But Kayvon Thibodeau was playing with his oh. hair on fire. So, so just because of that and him winning his one-on-one -on -one matchups, not just against tight ends, but against Tyler Smith, who's a pretty damn good tackle, even though he's a rookie. I'm gonna go with a, I think a six point eight. What about you? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be much higher in this one. I'm going seven point. Actually, I'm gonna go eight point two because I'll be honest. You guys just watch it on the film too. There were a lot of like, how about the rep where, where Dak throws the touchdown to Dalton Schultz? That's a four man pressure that's immediately in Dak Prescott's face. Yes, he's able to like quickly catch the ball, process the right side of the field while he's like catching the snap, then look to the left where Pinnock was taking the flat right out and then come back to Schultz. But the pressure is that that shows how fast the pressure got there with just four men. And they got pressure all day with multiple guys. The difference was Dak Prescott processed it fast every time, read the hots right, got the ball out. And so that's just like the quarterback you face. But that can't judge the pass right based on the quarterback. So even though on the like people might hear this and be like people who didn't, you know, watch the film, if they just like saw it on Twitter, be like, how can you give such a high grade to the pass rush? We had X amount of sacks and the Cowboys, you know, scored three straight touchdowns in the second half. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean the pass rush isn't getting there. There are other factors like quarterback play and like play calling and like can Darnay Holmes hold up against CD lamb? No. And things like that, that are kind of determining some of these plays. And so sometimes there's just the line, like we saw the Dalton, uh, I'm sorry, the Jake Ferguson play. There's just nobody there. Jake, Jake Ferguson's wide open for a 35 yard gain. So I would give it a higher grade. Just, just personally, this was one of my favorite films from a pass rush standpoint. And Thibodeau is a big reason for that. Yeah, and mostly the reason why you're so high is kind of a testament to Dak Prescott because the pressure was yeah. there, just his ability to get rid of the football. Yeah, I think that's a good take. For me, I'm looking at it more from the standpoint of they didn't sack him once. Like the pressure yeah. is great. And I love the fact that they pressured him, but not getting a sack in that situation and some of those big, like third and long situations. I know Dak is Dak and he's great in those types of scenarios, but. Right. It's tough for me to give him that high of a grade because of that. But I do think you're on to something because pressure was there. It's just Dak Prescott threw some of those balls with elite anticipation. And if those three times where Thibodeau was held weren't weren't 
holding like not not, not yeah. necessarily if they were called by the ref if the if the tackle was just like shit i got beat and i'm not if tyler Smith was just like, i got beat and i'm not gonna i don't want to take a penalty those could have been sacks so those three plays yeah. and then the time where thibodeau has him in the backfield and dak does like a nice like duck and spin out that's another one that could have been a sack so there were four plays that really could have been sacks that just weren't um but yeah it is what it is how about the run defense grade i'm curious to get your take on that run defense let's yeah, go a with one. a yeah let's go with a i think a high three so i'm gonna go with a 3.9 because there are some plays that are really well yeah really well um i would say executed by the giants run defense and then there are some plays where there weren't where guys mainly Go figure, lost contain. Like just losing right. contain has been such an issue, whether it be O'Shane Zimenez or Julian Love on that one play on the backside, which was mainly because Dak Prescott threw the block too. So I think a 3.8, I think it's better than I expected. It really was. I think that's that's one way to say it because the counter game really didn't fool them. Like the Giants right. were relatively in good position every time Dallas went with counter. It's just they came up with huge runs to the outside, like 22 yard run from Ezekiel Elliott on a pitch because O'Shane Zimenez screwed up. The 12 yard run by CD Lang because O'Shane Zimenez screwed up, stuff like right. that. See, that's going to, you know, force me to not give them a high grade. They rushed for 169 yards. That's not something that you necessarily want. But I kind of thought Tony Pollard was going to have like 120 yards and just absolutely embarrass the Giants in this game. But that didn't happen either. They bottled that dude up. It was more Ezekiel Elliott embarrassing the Giants, but it still wasn't the reason they lost. No. I'll go three five. I agree with you. There were some bright spots in the run game. There were some down spots too. Shane Zimenez is not going to be like he had a nice start. Nice rebirth at the start. I'm fine with him with this current roster, but he's not someone I would be looking like. He's not on my radar as far as resigning goes because I just feel like he's ultimately going to be a liability against the run for most of his career. And he's not really offering too much. He had one nice pass rush where he got a hit on Dak, but he's not like some kind of special pass rusher by any means either. So I, I would say 3-5 there for the run defense. And we'll wrap up there. That's all we have on the defensive film breakdown today. Keep it locked and loaded. We got another preview podcast coming up this week for the Washington Commanders game. We're going to get another former player on, so hopefully we can get some insight. He is a, he's a former NFL wide receiver. We won't tell you who just yet. So we're going to try to do what we did with, with – um, Glover Quinn and we talked a little bit about the nuances of playing defensive back position. I know a lot of you guys love that specific part. It, it fits well with what our podcast is all about, the X's and O's. So we'll get some insight into playing the wide receiver position. What do you think of how the Giants receivers are playing? His thoughts on separation versus the court, like all the things that we that are kind of off discussed on Twitter and no one really has a great answer for. Some people are so set in their ways with one way. We'll get a we'll get an NFL player's perspective on it, which I think will help us at least get a more context into what's going on with the Giants pass game right now. So thanks and keep it locked and loaded. One more thing that we haven't, I haven't asked for, for in a while. We haven't had a iTunes five-star review and a uh, star five-star rating and review in a while. So we're still sitting in eight eighteen. We've been there for like two months. If you haven't rated and reviewed the podcast, if you may be new to it, or you just never took the time, I would love to, to get to a thousand uh, ratings on iTunes. It's been a goal for a while. I think it'll help us kind of move up their algorithm. So that's just like another hundred, 175 of, of you hopefully listening in who will take the time it can literally take you as 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 little as as 10 seconds if you don't want to leave a review which i'm fine with you could just leave the five star rating to help boost us but if you want to give us a five star rating and a review write a question in there we'll answer it on the on the on the mailbag podcast when we get to that and same thing for youtube please subscribe to our youtube hit the bell so you get new videos and make sure you like any video you watch like we have these videos that are going up with like you know, a few thousand views, but only like 38 likes or 65 likes, please hit the like button as you're watching. It's only going to take one second and it really helps us. And again, all these things are free, but they somehow do really help us. So, so I'll ask for them all the time and, and hopefully you can appease me by doing so. Otherwise have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.